The following day went well, suspiciously so in Twitch's opinion. The rest of us were just glad not to have any new crises crop up on the day before our mission. The drunken old commissar was brought along to drills again, but aside from a few legionnaires obviously keeping tabs on us, there was no sign of the opposing force and things went smoothly, or at least as smoothly as a round of field exercises performed while carrying a belligerent, hungover old man with the power to administer shocks directly to your spine could go. The real good news was when we managed to turn up two more badges in the incoming laundry, one of them belonging to a stormtrooper sergeant who we'd seen on duty at the building. Counting the one in the interrogator's stash that brought us up to six, enough to get all of us plus Amy or one of the trainees, past the automated portion of the building's security. Well, at least if Tink was right about the card slave's ability to, as he put it, clone the creds. Otherwise the majority of our little strike force would probably be facing some pointed questions about why someone whose badge granted them access as a nutrition technician was trying to enter an evidence storage building. There was also the slight issue of the names and pictures physically printed on the cards, but having done our share of gate guarding, we were fairly certain that nobody actually looked at those. Probably. In any case, we had enough cards, and while we had our cadet overseer distracted, see, napping for half the shift, an entire hopper load of stormtrooper uniforms, complete with helmets and assorted neckwear, was crammed behind a dryer. With the scan proof scarfs Tink and Twitch had made, a little pouch of supplies made from the last scraps of the fabric, and a set of vaguely official looking orders drawn up by Doc and the ex-scribe, the physical prep was done. All that was left to do was meet up with Amy and hope like hell she had our intel. The note that Amy's messenger had passed us said she'd be in one of the storage buildings near the commissar Y end of the base, half an hour before the evening lockdown. Being a bunch of suspicious bastards, we'd scouted the location, double checked a note to make sure that the handwriting matched and there weren't any subtle the commissariat is onto us hints, and had brought our entire force along, commissar included, just in case it was all a cunning trap. The good news was it wasn't, the bad news was that this was just because it was an extremely uncunning one. We spotted the large cluster of aggressively nonchalant legionnaires, loitering in the general vicinity of our destination, from halfway across the compound. The big dumb bastard sitting on the building's front step was just a redundant redundancy. It belatedly occurred to us that firstly, passing secret notes and arranging clandestine meetings is exactly the sort of thing that the criminal underworld is known for, secondly, there might have been a thing or two we forgot to tell Amy about our current situation, and finally, unless there was a second female cadet commissar with sororitous white hair, she'd just entered the building. A brief confab was held, which mostly consisted of everyone taking turns blaming each other, and then Nubby, Twitch, and two of the trainees broke off to loop around while Sarge led the rest of us right into the hornet's nest. The big familiar goon gave a solid attempt at a shit-eating grin when he saw us, but the two black eyes, broken nose, and missing teeth made it a bit hard for him. He settled for some sullen glaring and a slurred command for the rest of us to stay put while Sarge was invited inside for a little chat with Darbosh. The smallish guard issue prefab storage shed was, well, a guard issue prefab storage shed. It had a floor, walls, boxes, shelves, and, because this was a penal legion after all, a bunch of locking metal grates that completely failed to deter anyone armed with a screwdriver, thin piece of metal, or sufficiently strong stick. The sign next to the door sporting the words thieves will be disemboweled with an entrenching tool was presumably a more effective deterrent. Even the table bolted in the middle of the floor was guard issue, as were the little folding chairs around it, and the two goons flanking the entrance, and especially their freshly sharpened entrenching tools. The at least half ogrin guarding the far door was starting the push it though, and while Amy was technically the definition of guard issue, the small dapper man sitting at the table with her, sporting a striped suit and a silenced auto pistol, most definitely wasn't. The mob boss, because there was no imaginable way the man could be anything else, gave Sarge a look that would have been intimidating if A. Sarge hadn't spent the last few years in inquisitorial service, and B. The man had a chin. Like, at all. It was just a steady, regular slope from his little mustache to his abnormally large Adam's apple. It was amazing. The only thing harder than not staring was not laughing, neither of which are smart when the other guy has a gun and you don't. 
So, in a quiet sort of desperation, Sludge dropped the man from his awareness and plopped into the free chair across the table from Amy. In a tone of forced chattiness, he asked how the markswoman's day was going. Amy rolled her eyes, though, you know, sitting around, being the bait in this half acid trap, because some stupid ass dipshit couldn't bother to tell me they'd started a fucking gang war with a shinless wonder over here. The silence that followed Amy's little remark was a choked one. Quite literally in the case of one of the goons behind Sarge, whose face was screwed up into something resembling a Felix Zenus. The mob boss attempted to simultaneously glare at both Amy and the unfortunate goon, but even if he could have pulled it off, the delayed boss oh her, her, her from the half ogren ruined it. In an attempt to regain some semblance of control over the situation, the man slammed his auto pistol onto the table, rounded on Sarge, and began to bark a question at the noncom. For his part, Sarge took one look at the mob boss, felt his eyes drag inexorably towards the area where the man's chin wasn't, and abruptly turned back to Amy to loudly ask if she'd heard we'd gotten assigned laundry duty again. Whether it was an effort to help Sarge in his moment of desperation, or just sheer desire to talk to someone who wasn't wearing a stupid pointy hat, Amy responded with some inane chatter about a cadet commissar who'd somehow managed to attach a bone collar to himself, and the pair started trading camp gossip in the best tradition of guardsmen everywhere. The mob boss and the assorted goons just sort of stared, obviously unsure of how to handle being blatantly ignored in favor of anecdotes about what Nubby found in the dumpster behind the quartermaster's tent. Eventually though, the conversation meanered into the topic of the transfer orders Amy had been asked to procure and where they'd wound up. The markswoman jerked a thumb at the big dumb goon and the grimy wad of papers in one of his fists, and asked what was so important about them anyway. Unfortunately, the mob boss took this as his cue. In an attempt at a tone of smug authority, the mob boss announced that he was deeply interested in Sarge's answer as well. What possible reason could there be for a washed up ex-guardsman to be secretly meeting with Commissar Sawface's favorite pet Sarge ignored the question, but raised an eyebrow at the word pet. Amy didn't actually respond, but her expression clearly conveyed her complete lack of desire to pursue the subject. Instead she asked whether it was true that Twitch had tried to stab her messenger to death with a plastic spoon. Sarge began to explain that it was actually a fork, at which point the mob boss's patience finally ran out and he screamed at both of them to just shut up. After a few seconds of hyperventilating, the chinless mob boss made a visible effort to reclaim his whole suave villain persona. He announced that if we weren't willing to talk, then they'd better just have a look and see what was so important about the papers Amy had been carrying. Lacking a suitably big and swivelly chair in which to lean back and menacingly tempt his fingers, the mob boss settled for tilting his folding chair as far as it would go. He gestured at his goons with one hand, while using the other, the one with the loaded gun in it, to steady himself against the table. There was a brief pause while the assorted goons waited to see if their boss was going to accidentally shoot someone, and then a second pause as a big dumb goon drew out a rather grimy wad of papers and visibly balked at the sheer amount of words on them. With a deeply furrowed unibrow and one finger moving along the page, the big goon began laboriously reading off the four-page standard administratum boilerplate at the head of our transfer orders. The mob boss sighed, started to raise his palm to his face, nearly tilted over backwards, and grudgingly yelled at the goon to skip ahead to the part where it said why we'd been transferred to the penal legion. In some ways the shinless mob boss was more clever than, well, everyone else we'd met, which is honestly pretty sad when you think about it. See, instead of shrugging off the concept of a bunch of guardsmen being sent to an inquisitorial penal legion for traffic tickets, he started asking questions. Specifically, after his broken nose goon slurred out the fourth count of failing to vacate in a timely manner, whether there were any non-traffic related convictions. Both Sludge and Amy struggled to keep their poker faces in place as, after nearly a minute of searching, the goon read off aiding and abetting Da Rogue Inquisitor, a uh, some high guardic guy with a Q name. The mob boss managed to keep his composure too, but Sarge could almost hear the oh so familiar I'm surrounded by idiots as he told his man to try sounding it out. The intense focus involved in deciphering the goon slurred speech while simultaneously keeping his chair balanced and maintaining the closest thing to a suavely confident expression possible without an actual jawline was probably why the man didn't notice both guardsmen casually shifting around in their seats. When, on the fourth attempt, the hinch goon managed to cue Arcus, but with a cue, 
the mob boss composure finally broke. He got as far as wait. Quirk as you mean Inquisitor Bloody Oak the same Bloody Oak that with only to be interrupted by a pair of sounds. One was a subtle metallic groan from the table, where Sarge's augmetic fingers had sunk up to the first joint into the surface, but this was overshadowed by a much louder and surprisingly high-pitched weeing noise coming from the part Ogren standing behind Amy. While the mob boss ranted, the markswoman had casually reached one of arms behind her head, and while she didn't have quite the same crushing power of Sarge's augmetic grip, her targets were much, much softer. Every man in the room, even the mob boss still balancing his stupid chair, stopped and stared in sympathetic horror as the unfortunate part Ogren swayed with every slight movement of the markswoman's hand. The tableau lasted a good 10 seconds before Amy delivered a final viscous twist and the giant goon toppled over like a slow motion video of a tree falling, which gave Amy just enough time to let out a panic squeak as several hundred kilos of goon landed directly on top her. The shocked pause continued, now punctuated by sobbing moans from the part Ogren and muffled curses from underneath him, until something finally gave, specifically, the bolts holding the table's top to its base. Physics being physics, the slightly bent metal tabletop flew off with enough force to, well, sheer metal bolts. The good news for the chinless mob boss was that said force was in the opposite direction from him. The bad news for the two goons behind Sarge was that he still had all five augmetic digits firmly embedded in the table's surface, and was pivoting with every ounce of force and weight his beefy noncom frame could muster. The whirring square of metal wasn't razor edged, but it still had more than enough sheer mass to crumple the chest of a goon who didn't duck in time, and seriously concuss the one who nearly did. According to Sarge's vaguely defined plan, the bloody tabletop of justice should have continued its arc and smashed into the mob boss right where his chin wasn't, literally decapitating the whole criminal organization in a single blow. Unfortunately tables aren't exactly known for being high precision weapons, and neither was Sarge for that matter. Outside, Doc, Tink, the trainees, and a score of assorted goons all flinched as the shed's door blew off its hinges and a ballistic table wobbled overhead like a badly thrown frisbee. There was a pause, followed by a screech of waist hem and the sound of someone panic firing a silenced auto pistol. The ensuing brawl had two distinct parts. Outside, Doc and Tink jumped one of the two exterior door guards while the ex-cleric and guardsman did for the other, but by the time both goons were down a perimeter had formed around the group, with the shed door in the no man's land in between. Things then stalled for a bit. On one side this was because Doc and Tink's group was outnumbered 4 to 1, and that was counting the snoring commissar mind you. On the other side it was because, well, they outnumbered Doc and Tink's group 4 to 1, so there was no reason why they had to be the first one to jump in and catch a wrench to the jaw. Far better to go second, or third, or maybe just stay at the back yelling yeah and get them until it was time to loot the corpses. This is, of course, why sergeants were invented, but the goons seemed to be rather short on those, so the fight stalled out while everyone just stood there and listened to the shouts and thumps coming from the shed. Per long-standing narrative tradition, the standoff was broken by a thrown bottle. Said bottle's contents were a matter of debate, which is to say, Twitch felt it should have contained 90% alcohol, a gelling agent, and a burning rag, while Nubby and the trainees had argued in favor of something that wouldn't draw the attention of every commissar in the camp, including the ones manning the inwards facing heavy stubbers up on the walls. In the end, the demo trooper had settled for a mix of the floor and drain cleaners he'd liberated from the laundry supply closet, which didn't have quite the same effect as a proper molotov, but still left three men coughing and clawing at their eyes as Twitch and Nubby's group mounted their charge. The inside portion of the brawl was, if possible, even less organized. While Sarge's opener had done a number on the entrenching tool armed goons behind him, it not only failed to remove the mob boss auto pistol from the equation, it hadn't even upset the man's balance. On the bright side, it's rather hard to simultaneously balance a chair on two legs, accurately fire a gun, and scream in terror as an enraged noncom throws himself towards you. This meant Sarge only took two of the four shots sent his way as he closed to melee range, and he managed to dodge two more through the masterful strategy of tripping over one of the concussed goons feebly twitching legs and falling flat on his face. Sarge still managed to make a grab for the auto pistol on his way down, and almost certainly would have snagged the weapon if the mob boss hadn't chosen that exact moment to finally teeter over backwards. 
So on one side of the room there was Amy still struggling to claw her way out from under the moaning goon grin. On the other, one door guard was busy coughing blood while his companion stared vaguely around the room and tried to remember how his legs worked. So with both Sludge and the mob boss lying on the floor, that meant the only person in the room still standing was the big dumb goon. Fortunately, the man lived up to his name and didn't immediately sprint over and start stomping on Sludge's head. Instead he took a few seconds to cram the transfer orders in a pocket and grab one of the fallen entrenching tools, before slowly swaggering his way across the room while thumping the tool in his hand and doing the best evil goon laugh he could manage with a broken nose. He was rather surprised when Sarge decided not to just lie there waiting for his skull to be caved in, and grabbed the nearest available weapon, the mob boss folding chair. Once again, Sludge spun around in a blur of metal, blood, and simmering non com rage, and where the bloody tabletop of justice failed, the equally bloody folding chair of vengeance did the trick. The big dumb goon blinked as the entrenching tool abruptly vanished from his hand along with most of the sensation in that arm. Next to him, the now ray concussed door guard flopped over in a boneless heap, and a little farther along the chinless mob boss staggered to his feet and raised the auto pistol just in time for the chair to sail under it, hit him square in the center of mass, and ragdoll him into the far wall. The mob boss wasn't the first thing to hit the wall though, he was beaten there by Amy thanks to a flailing ogren sized boot to the backside right as the markswoman finally managed to claw her way out from under its owner. Amy opened her eyes to find the room upside down and a ballistic mob boss bearing down on her, and immediately closed them again. When she reopened them, the sight of a silenced auto pistol pointed directly at her nose refocused her attention nicely, and after taking a second to see if the owner was going to pull the trigger, the markswoman lunged for the gun. At roughly the same moment as Amy reached the auto pistol, the goon grin finished climbing to his feet, and no longer blocked by his bulk. The room's rear door burst open to admit four legionnaires equipped with knives and entrenching tools. Amy attempted some quick math involving the auto pistol's clip size, the number of shots fired, and how many more goons were likely to be on the way, and then settled for pressing the gun against the limp mob boss head and screaming at everyone to freeze. There was a tense silence, broken only by a sort of wet and crunchy sound from the man's neck chin hybrid as the gun's barrel pushed his head over sideways. And then farther sideways, and farther, and farther. Outside, the fight had stalled out again. The mob boss shouted command and twitch and Nubby's surprise attack had briefly escalated things, but without any real leadership present. On either side, everyone's self-preservation instincts had taken over. The good news was that our little force had managed to steadily creep towards the door over the course of the brawl, and Doc was able to take a peek at the mess inside and relay the situation while the rest of us covered his back. Mind you, the angle of the door meant that Doc couldn't see the wall where Amy and the mob boss had landed or even as far as where Sarge was desperately trying to remain on his feet for that matter, so from the rest of our perspective what followed was a bit confusing. First someone yelled freeze, then someone else yelled day whacked da boss, and then there had been a long pause as everyone looked at the big dumb goon. Doc described, for all present, a dawning expression of a, sort of like one of those little smashed faced bug eyed dogs slowly realizing it's been left unattended next to a steak dinner and trying to figure out what to do next. Further commentary was cut off as the big dumb boss pointed a finger and began to yell something, only to be interrupted himself by an ear ringing, window rattling, parade ground bellow of, Commissar down prisoner riot in the storage sheds needless to say, Sarge's decision to call the entire bloody commissariat down on us caught everyone by surprise, including Sarge. What exactly was supposed to have happened next was a mystery, which he later blamed on the fact that he'd been a bit busy and, you know, shot. What did happen was that everyone present, with the exception of the abruptly awakened old commissar, froze in place as the guards up on the walls started yelling to each other and the spotlights mounted on their heavy stubbers began playing across the surrounding area. Then an alarm began to blare from the direction of the command building and the big dumb boss screamed at his men to kill us and hide the bodies before the red coats arrived while he handled the old man, and then valiantly sprinted past his reinforcements and out the back door. Doc relayed this all to the rest of the group, and by extension, all of the surrounding goons too. There were a few seconds of thoughtful silence, punctuated by the occasional meaty thump and silenced auto pistol shot from inside, not to mention the distinct non-sound of nearly a third of the goons not having been anywhere near there tonight sir, no, 
sir, and then the remaining two thirds charged. Within a few seconds Twitch and two of the trainees were bleeding, Doc was being pulled up out of a muddy fascipland by another trainee, Nubby was casually sidling towards the crawl space under the shed, and Tink had been viscously bottled in the back of the head by the old commissar. Inside, Sudge looked around fruitlessly for any more readily weaponizable furniture, and then swore and threw himself into a downright impressive dive for the fleeing boss. His subsequent combat roll under 3 out of 4 wildly swinging entrenching tools and smashing through 2 pairs of legs would have been more impressive if the legs hadn't belonged to Amy's chair. The resulting confused half chair half non com wrecking ball smashed into the wall next to the door and slid to the floor, where it alternated between bleeding, swearing, and trying to bludgeon the ankles of the 4 confused reinforcement goons. Amy missed all this, on account of the half ogrin trying to rip her head off. Well, more determinedly waddling towards her with his knees held tightly together, but there was no questioning the murderous rage in those piggy little eyes. So the markswoman dropped the mob boss corpse, took aim, and placed an auto pistol round directly into the half ogrin's forehead. Her expression when the bullet bounced off with a little hollow bonk and wee yow sound would have been amusing if anyone had the attention to spare. In panicked reflex, Amy flipped the fire selector to auto and tried again. Two of the six subsonic rounds wound up in the ceiling. One hit the dead mob boss, and the remaining three just stopped. Firmly embedded in the half ogrin's forehead as the big guy kept coming. There was another moment of panic as Amy realized she had somewhere between one and three bullets left, and, if she crawled fast, about ten seconds in which to use them. Fortunately the markswoman's training kicked in before she ran out of either, and she belatedly shifted her aim downwards. The half ogrim's eyes widened and he clapped both his hands over his groin, only to keel over to the side as Amy shot out his left knee with her last two bullets instead. She then swore as the big bastard just started crawling towards her. In the middle of this chaotic little melee, math was happening. Well, not math per se, Tink had a bit of a concussion, so it was more vaguely math-shaped blob slowly drifting across his brain like fuzzy little clouds as he desperately tried to stay upright. It involved ex-goons, Y-guardsmen, and Z seconds until the commissariat arrived, and Z was worryingly large. He vaguely looked around, registering an entire drop shuttle's worth of real bad shit, and the considerably less than Z seconds left before it really started going down. Tink's gaze finally landed back on the old commissar, indiscriminately menacing everyone nearby with the jagged remains of the bottle he'd just broken over Tink's head. In a flash of inspiration, the techie pulled out the commissar's data slit, ducked under the wildly swinging bottle, grabbed the man's non-drinking hand, and jammed the greasy, sausage-fingered paw down onto the data slit's big red button. He then flopped to the ground, flailing around like a fish, as his penal legion discipline collar replaced his nervous system with white hot razor wire. Whatever the big dumb boss had done to slow down the arrival of the commissariat must have worked, because it was a solid, and very unpleasant. Two more minutes before the relief force finally arrived, and found Amy and the old commissar surrounded by spastically twitching legionnaires. The pointy hats arrived in two distinct groups. The first one consisted of the old sour-faced bastard, backed up by his entire retinue of cadets, and with the big dumb boss nervously lurking right behind him. You know, just to make things obvious. Or he was lurking, until he crossed the invisible 50 meter radius around our commissar's data slot and abruptly flopped over into the mud like the rest of us. Sour face actually stopped for him, or at least to give him a few kicks, before grumpily taking out his own data slot and tapping in an override command. We all enjoyed a brief second of blessed relief, and then the collars reactivated as the drunk old bastard mashed his thumb back down on the panic button while stubbornly glaring at his counterpart. Nobody except Amy was in any condition to appreciate the ensuing pissing match. She described it as a struggle of wills worthy of story and fucking song and gleefully recounted Sourface's expression when he finally stomped across the field to wrest the data slit away, just in time for the second group of commissars to arrive and ask what in the emperor's name he was doing. The second commissariat relief force was led by our two depressed cadets, who had the familiar look of people desperately hoping that whatever was going on wasn't their fault. Rather more importantly, it was also commanded by the commandant, who, since Amy had apparently scheduled our meeting during some big distracting brass brief, 
had brought along a nice big audience of senior officers for the good old public reaming that followed. Now, it didn't start as a reaming. Getting caught mid-slap fight with another commissar might have been a bit undignified, but was perfectly understandable to anyone who'd actually met our commissar. The point where the discussion escalated happened pretty quickly though, roughly 5 choked seconds after Amy identified herself as Cadet Von Humperding to be exact. She didn't even get a chance to start lying about what happened. The expression on the commandant's face just sort of congealed, and then started reddening as he looked between Amy and the grumpy old commissar, until he finally exploded into full on screaming rage. Like all properly epic reamings, this one had evidently been building up for a good long while. The gist was that Sour Face did not run this camp and the commandant was well and truly done with his bullshit little power games, but the fine details went on at length. Once or twice the old bastard tried to interrupt with stuff about this being the right time and place, but the commandant wasn't having any of that, and just kept on going, all while our drunk old commissar watched him with sort of vindictive glee. The rest of us were more focused on getting our shit together now that the collars were finally turned off, and figuring out how to talk our way out of this when the commandant got around to asking questions. For like the 16th time, our asses were saved by our former trainees. The ex-scribe and cleric had been thinking down exactly the same lines as Tink, but had the forethought to actually put on their scan-proof scarf thingies first. Then when Tink beat them to the punch, they'd then been smart enough not to walk around and get noticed. Now they were up on their feet, helping Amy collect everyone and providing someone who was not Sarge to handle the talking. Our drunk old commissar's attention was seized via a dose of stim and the offer of a fresh bottle. We got his gaze focused on the general vicinity of Amy, who was actually trying to look like a grateful rescuee, and then a very edited version of the last several minutes was remembered to him. We weren't sure how much really sank in, but the idea that he might have done something heroic definitely seemed to have been established, and he seemed nearly coherent by the time the ex-cleric unsubtly asked how much it would annoy or face if Amy were to become one of his cadets. Eventually, the raging commandant brought us all back to the present series of totally foreseeable, easily preventable, completely self-inflicted frack-ups, on cue. Amy stepped forward again to give her report, and then surprised the shit out of us with this sudden spiel of high gothic and this weird sort of bossy nasal drawling accent. It honestly sounded nothing like her, well, not the bossy part, more the baked in tone of aristocratic arrogance that and the lack of profanity. In any case, whatever Amy had just said, at least half of the commissars present understood it, judging by the expression of dawning horror as they all looked from her to our nearly coherent commissar. To our amazement, the man actually sat up, and then slurred, something. In the best traditions of overly competent subordinates and evil royal advisors, the cleric translated an acceptance of Amy's life debt, as well as a request that the commandant allow him to take over her training. The commandant just stared, his eyes bugging out slightly and mouth hanging open, until the old commissar broke the silence. Course she's got nished it Amy maintained her poker face, and nodded in agreement with this sage wisdom. While everyone else in the audience, the word definitely qualified at this point, tried to figure out what to say after that, Commissar Sourface smugly pointed out that the old drunk already had his maximum of two cadets. The commandant, visibly relieved to have something else to occupy his attention, rounded on the man with a bellow of yes, two, not twelve tell me, can you count to twelve let's practice on those cadets behind you one two three before the reaming could really get going again. We gave our commissar a firm poke. The man abruptly interrupted the raging commandant, and in something very near to complete sentences, announced that his current pupils were doing so well that they were ready to return to regular training rotation. The appallingly hopeful expressions that suddenly seized the two cadets' faces was something to see, as was the commandant's when sour face interrupted yet again. Showing an absolute inability to take a hint, the vindictive bastard snidely pointed out that our commissar didn't even know what his cadets looked like, much less whether they were fit for duty. This time the commandant actually paused to consider the inarguably valid point, which gave the two cadets time to solve the problem by running over to their chair-bound superior and desperately saluting him. Our commissar surveyed the sweating pair with vindictive glee, and then jabbed a finger at one of them yeah, dish one here. Haven't caught time with any more porno slates of felinid goods women since the commandant cleared his throat and asked if he meant cadet Ureve. 
and was informed that I called I'm Yiffy. Cause the porno slaves of the before the blushing cadet in question loudly thanked his superior for his support and ran for the barracks. The other cadet, an expression of desperate optimism on his face, pointed out that the commissar had said both of them were ready and got shot down with a shut up sniffy. After a few seconds of croggled silence, the commandant just nodded at Amy, and then we seized our chance and made a tactical withdrawal under cover of Sourface's attempt to snap graduate 11 of his cadets into full commissars, and the commandant's enraged response. A miserable looking cadet sniffy started to come with us, but Amy's cheerful, yes cheerful, insistence that she wouldn't have any trouble taking care of the commissar by herself cheered him up immensely and he buggered off. The old commissar was also cheered by Amy's declaration and insisted she ride up on the pallet with him where he could keep an eye on her. She handed him a fresh bottle instead, which he accepted as a decent substitute. After a short detour to the medical tents to commissarially requisition some supplies, we returned to our barracks for our traditional post-battle discuss what the hell just happened while Doc removes foreign objects from Sarge. Amy was introduced to the trainees without any hair related acrimony, the commissar was tucked away into a corner with a fresh nightcap, and a round of drinks was brought out while we caught our prodigal markswoman up on events. For her part, Amy didn't volunteer any details about her time in the commissariat, and nobody aside from Nubby was dumb enough ask. When Nubby had been retrieved from his defenestration, and Doc pronounced Sarge sufficiently patched up for both of them to grab a single drink, the subject of our upcoming infiltration was raised. With Amy, everything seemed almost too easy. We no longer needed to worry about the time limit on our collars, since she'd be able to go get a cadet at Hislet first thing in the morning and bring it inside with us. We didn't need to worry about those stupid room codes that the big dumb mob boss had ran off with either, since she'd just be able to grab the commissariat's copy of our transfer orders while she was there. Best of all, we now had a legitimate reason to go into the evidence storage facility to go get her stuff. Overall, the day was declared to have been a resounding strategic success, a term Sarge flinched at, even if nobody, not even our former trainees, believed any of it had been intentional. Even the old commissar was in high spirits, especially about Amy bunking in our barracks, and repeatedly insisted on being wheeled back into the conversation to regale his new cadet with slurred ramblings about his glorious former career. Our good mood lasted until Ravalli, or to be more specific, 30 seconds after Ravalli was supposed to happen. The lack of several dozen Vox units blaring the traditional distorted approximation of horns, played by equally distorted approximations of musicians, had Sarge sitting bolt upright and considerably more awake than their presence ever had. After patiently waiting an entire minute to see if it was just late, he bowled the rest of us upright, and a reconnaissance expedition was launched. Psst. Hey, leaning closer. This is fucking ASMR channel now. You know it's pretty fucking beast. Titties. <laughs> Go see titties. <laughs> Lots of titties. All the titties. <laughs> Go over to the website, check out all the models. You guys know the score. We have some really nice looking models over there. And we have a lot of... Uh, sci-fi gothic? Yeah. Let's call them sci-fi gothic. And if models isn't your shit, we have loads of subclasses and we keep adding them. Every other week or so, we, we, we like, add we, a lot. We, we, we got a lot. D, D, Look, guys. we've got big brains. We add shit. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, go over to the website. Check out everything. If you haven't subscribed, what the fuck you doing? Hit subscribe. Hit the notification bell as well. And let's get back to the video. The camp was quiet. Primarily populated by the few other lifelong soldiers in the Legion nervously whispering to each other about the unexpected break-in routine. There was a small crowd gathering at the mess tent, but aside from that the only visible activity was around the command building and commissar's barracks. On closer inspection this activity seemed to involve a lot of boxes being taken out to the shuttle pod, and the realization of the only likely explanation hit us all at once. The penal legion was being deployed. Amy was immediately sent in along with the still snoring commissar for moral support, and returned a short time later with cadet Sniffy in tow. The morose cadet seemed to have reached a whole new level of despair, and mostly just whined about how everyone except him, Amy, and the two old commissars would be moving out. Amy and the trainees tried to prod him for more details, specifically details about the daily details and if they'd still be happening. They weren't having much luck until Sarge stepped forward, 
pulled the commissar's data slot out of his chair, and handed it to the ex-scribe with directions to just transfer the little turd. Sniffy sniffed, and pointed out that he wasn't an idiot and had tried that on his first day. The commissar's data slot didn't have permissions to do anything more than a cadet's, for obvious reasons. Still though, this show of good faith won some grudging cooperation from the cadet. His remaining reluctance evaporated completely when Sergeant the XPDF trooper pulled the young man aside, and pointed out that Amy wasn't the sort of noble scion to forget a favor, and neither was her mother. A decidedly unsubtle hint that if Sniffy helped us with our little laundry run he might get his longed for transfer sooner, perhaps even today, was enough to win him over completely. With the downright eager assistance of Cadet Sniffy it was established that there wasn't an official schedule for work details, since the embarkation would be starting that afternoon. Fortunately, there wasn't anything scheduled at all until then, so if we cleared it with the perimeter commander, we could presumably go whenever we wanted. He wasn't exactly clear why Amy, or the rest of us, wanted to go do laundry so bad, but he definitely wasn't someone to look a potential gift horse in the mouth. Amy requisitioned him as combination guide and commissar pallet pusher, and went off to get approval, a data slit, our transfer orders, and a damn gun. By the time Amy returned, son Sniffy, the camp was in a quiet uproar as the rumor of imminent deployment spread like wildfire. Under occupied legionnaires milled around speculating about what sort of meat grinder awaited them, and trading gossip about the death of the mob boss and Commissar Sourface's very public fall from grace the previous night. Under the cover of all this, nobody even noticed us until our whole group had made it to the main gate, where a distracted pair of cadets waved us through without even checking Amy's proffered data slot. Once in the laundry building, preparations began in earnest. Doc and most of the trainees went to do a quick scout of the freight bay to make sure we could still use it as our exit, and to catch the name of the next shift's commander if possible. The commissar, napping peacefully thanks to a preemptive sedative from Doc's limited supply, was parked in the corner with Tink, who was prepping a laundry cart with our uniforms and supplies. While the ex-scribe briefed Amy on the front door security procedures she'd be talking us through, the rest of us did a load of laundry, or at least we started to do a load, until our collars all suddenly activated at max power and someone kicked in the door. Commissar Sour Face practically radiated smugness as he strode into the room, one hand holding his data slot while the other kept his bolt pistol trained on Amy. He was alone for a change, not that it seemed to bother him as he snidely reminded Amy that rule number 3 was no weapons and gestured at her to disarm. For her part, the markswoman stood stock still, glaring at the man with more hatred than any of us had ever seen before, not that we were in any condition to see it right then either. After several seconds of futile stalling, Amy grudgingly parted with her newly acquired Les Pistol and Chain Sword, earning her a rage-inducing good girl from the smug commissar. Her data slot came next, though it was already showing an unauthorized user message on its screen, and the whole lot was kicked out the door, which was kicked shut in turn. Surprisingly, he then holstered the pistol, swapping it for his damned data slot and gloatingly holding his finger over the execute button as he surveyed the room full of twitching guardsmen. He snidely reminded Amy that there was a reason the regulations for bad fraternizing with the rabble, not that he believed that's what we actually were. Then, to our collective amazement, the man started monologuing. It quickly became apparent that Sour Face wasn't any more hinged than our commissar, at least judging by his rant about how Amy was going to be his ticket out of there, one way or another. And we were in position to judge, because inside the laundry hamper Tink had fallen into when his collar activated, the techie had finally managed to wrangle the anti-scan bag around his collar. It was sheer luck more than anything else that he wasn't spotted as he poked his head up to survey the situation, and even luckier that the exact two tools he needed were right there next to him. While Amy desperately kept herself still and the commissar ranted about not so former inquisitorial agents thinking they were smarter than him, Tink grabbed our commissar's data slit, carefully set it for the lowest shock setting, and overrode the previous command. Down on the floor, we all gained a newfound appreciation for that lowest collar setting, and did our best to catch our breath without blowing our cover, while Tink dug out the silenced auto pistol we'd appropriated last night and took careful aim. The commissar was too wrapped up ranting at Amy about how he'd beaten the inquisition at their own game to notice anything until the auto pistol hit him in the forehead, as in literally, with a little metallic bonk. 
because we hadn't managed to grab any ammo for the damn thing. Honestly, it was a mystery why we'd even brought it. In any case, even if Tink didn't have the same sort of lethal throwing arm as Sarge, and had actually been aiming for the data slit in the commissar's hand, the pistol's impact butt first into the man's forehead gave us the opening we needed. Actually, the impact itself barely even phased the commissar. It was the second or so of confusion as he brought up the data slit and fruitlessly tried to find Tink's collar on its display that gave Amy enough time to lunge for the man's neck. Not that Amy's attack went any better than Tink's. The crazy old commissar was fast. Far faster than someone his age had any right to be in our opinions. Amy's lunge abruptly changed direction as the man spun out of the way, grabbed one of her reaching arms, and threw her across the room accompanied by the audible pop of a dislocating shoulder joint. However, this in turn gave Twitch enough time to act, and one of his homemade chain grenades smashed against the commissar's chest. Amazingly, even getting doused in whatever cocktail Twitch put in those things wasn't enough to do more than slow the crazy old bastard. The commissar reeled backwards, holding his breath and keeping his eyes closed until he was clear, and then abruptly turned and put his boot into the ex-scribe's face mid-tackle. Nubby's own lunch fared a bit better thanks to his shockproof augmetics, carrying him over the face-planted trainee and directly towards the commissar's face only for the man to snatch him by the collar midair and hurl the little trooper across the room. It was when he realized that Nubby was holding his precious data slit that the man started to panic. The commissar immediately reached for both his pistol and chain sword, but didn't manage to draw either before Sarge's shoulder check hit him in much the same way a flirant hits a dumb scout marine. The impact as the pair hit the industrial scale laundry units was quite literally bone shattering. And while Sarge managed to stagger upright on his third attempt, the crazy old bastard stayed down for the count. By the time Doc's group returned a convenient minute later, we retrieved everyone from their assorted hard landings, disarmed the apparently unconscious commissar, and opened some windows before we all choked on weaponized cleaning agents. Our medic was not exactly thrilled to find himself dealing with yet another round of collar burns, not to mention the ex-scribe's badly broken nose, Amy's dislocated shoulder, and Sarge's self-inflicted concussion. On the bright side, the scouting mission had gone fine and our acquisition of Commissar Sourface's unrestricted control data slot opened up some interesting opportunities, assuming Tink could get it to work for him that is. The Commissar's data slot had locked itself the second it left his hands, and was now demanding both a biometric authorization and access code. Per usual, Tink claimed this was easy to bypass, or would have been if he had all his stuff, but lacking those he'd just see what he could do with our Commissar's slate and a screwdriver. After several minutes of poking at the thing and ignoring helpful suggestions from Twitch and Nubby, he informed us we had a choice. The techie was fairly sure that he could get around the access code by restarting the data slit, leaving just the biometric lock. Problem was the data slit was still broadcasting its normal signal to our collars, and restarting would disable that. If he was wrong we'd lose the signal, and since Amy's data slit was completely disabled, that'd leave us short. Sarge, Doc, and Twitch all listened to Tink's explanation and pondered the problem, while Amy flexed her relocated arm, and stalked off to retrieve her gear. After several seconds, Sarge broke up the discussion, and asked Tink just how sure pretty sure was, and whether anyone had checked if the slate's biometric lock was one of the fancy ones that could tell if the user was conscious or not. In the background, there was the high-pitched whine of a chainsword activating, followed by a short terrified scream, and then the sort of grisly rending sounds and screaming typically associated with cornered space marines. Twitch told everyone that he'd known the guy was faking being unconscious, and Tink suggested that it would probably be better just to leave the slate on. Nubby was dispatched to find a mop while the rest of us got back to work on the mission prep and laundry, and Sarge did a mental wellness check on our hyperventilating markswoman. Which is to say, he asked Amy if she was feeling better, got a yes, asked if she wanted to talk about it, got a no, and then shrugged and yelled at her to clean her uniform. Amy blushed. Once the load was done, our laundry hamper was prepped, and the commissar's remains had been scraped into a laundry hamper of its own. Sludge gave the order to move out. The trainees went off to the freight entrance with the bin full of fresh dice commissar and the man's data slit, with directions to keep our exit open and make sure nothing important got accidentally incinerated mid-mission. The rest of us, still wearing our penal legion uniforms except for Amy, 
formed up around our laundry trolley and the commissar's pallet, and went right in the front door. The lobby of the mundane evidence storage building wasn't particularly impressive, consisting primarily of a drab little carpeted room with a few uncomfortable chairs and a recaf machine that had last been cleaned sometime during the Horus heresy. The security checkpoint immediately passed it was rather more impressive, what with all automated gun emplacements and cybermastiff kennels lining the airlock-esque scan room leading into the building proper. The terminally bored inquisitorial stormtroopers manning the checkpoint were equally impressive, at least until they registered our decidedly non-inquisitorial appearances, and brought out the recaf mugs they'd stashed out of sight when the door opened. Rather than wait to be asked what in the emperor's name we thought we were doing there, we rolled the cavalcade past the door sentries and into the scan room, where Amy stepped forward and announced that she was there to get her shit. The stormtrooper sergeant manning the little desk just inside the scan room eyeballed our spokeswoman in appropriately surgenty fashion, but dropped the act when she added and deliver some laundry. The sight of a bin of freshly cleaned uniforms, topped with a massive heap of still warm socks and underwear, caught the immediate attention of every stormtrooper present like, well, a load of clean socks. It's a soldier thing. Unfortunately for the grunts on duty, Amy wasn't willing to part with her laundry bribe, at least not without a signed receipt, specifically from the next shift's company, these being orders from her vaunted superior, currently snoring on the pallet, Amy wasn't willing to budge on the issue, leaving the stormtrooper sergeant trapped between two equally valid maxims about letting sleeping commissar's officers lie, on cue, Sarge suggested leaving the laundry bribe somewhere secure. C, the nearest security break room, while Amy's other request was dealt with, and a signature could be obtained on the way out. Sarge's pointed interjection earned him some eyeballing of his own, but for once his diplomacy training paid off. A simple grunt of ex stormtrooper, a gesture at all of us with a second grunt of unit, and a final grunt of bullshit inquisitorial power politics was enough to elevate our collective status from scum to poor bastards. Amy's own assurance that she was only wearing this dumb fucking hat because of political bullshit bore fruit as well, especially when she more formally requested entry to pick up the personal effects of one Amelia von Humperding before we all got deployed in a few hours. Interestingly, all the goodwill our blatant bribery earned us was overshadowed by the stormtrooper's response on hearing Amy's name. The sergeant did a double take, and then buzzed someone on his desk's vox unit, before abruptly getting up and leaving through the door behind his desk. The two stormtroopers on door duty just shrugged when we looked at them. After a short wait, during which Nubby managed to exchange a few pairs of socks for a round of hot drinks, the sergeant returned accompanied by something so surprising that lesser men would have spat their recaf. A stormtrooper Rupert. Not the Rupert of course, rather the exact sort of painfully keen and woefully inexperienced junior officer that had doomed more honest guardsmen than all the traitor marine legions combined, but in a stormtrooper uniform. We all stared in shock, I mean, logically we knew that stormtroopers had junior officers just like everyone else, but we'd always assumed they just started at captain or something. Seeing a stormtrooper with LT tabs was just wrong and the experience was not helped by the way he boggled at Amy like a recruit that had just been issued his first porno slate. After a small prod from his sergeant, the stormtrooper lieutenant stepped forward and ascertained that Amy was indeed here for her stuff, and yes it was urgent, because we were all deploying, and yes Amy was really one of those von Humperdings. The obvious firmly stated, the LT retreated through the door along with the rather put upon sergeant, only to reappear at the room's observation window and press his face up against the decidedly two-way glass. Nubby and Tink snickered as a large foggy patch grew around the storm Rupert's face, but fell silent when Amy reminded them who here had a chain sword. After several awkward minutes, the LT disappeared from the window and the stormtrooper sergeant returned. While a dozen servo skulls emerged from the wall ports and flitted around, presumably doing scanny stuff, the stormtrooper sergeant quietly informed Amy that there was a bit of a paperwork issue, but not to worry, because they'd gotten her the good scribe. Said good scribe turned out to be a wizened old man in an augmentic wheelchair, unfortunately accompanied by the lieutenant. The jury was still out on whether the little tit was a ladder climber trying to score points with the family of a lord general, 
or if he just had a thing for women in slightly blood-stained commissariat uniforms. But whatever the reason he was practically bending over backwards to make Amy happy, and this included volunteering a squad of stormtroopers to replace her retinue of penal legionnaires. On cue, Sludge volunteered to take our bin of laundry down to the guard room, along with the LT's orders, and before long a whole squad of neckerchief sporting stormtroopers returned, ready to escort and go for the facility's honored guest. The question of whether the lieutenant knew the appearance of his own men well enough to spot the swap was sidestepped when Amy blithely responded to the facility's no weapons rule by handing over her gore covered chain sword and asking the LT to personally take care of cleaning it for her. With the storm Rupert out of the way, the scribe assigned to us proved every bit as good as the sergeant had promised. He waved away Amy's sob story about her orders being mislaid and the time critical nature of things, assuring her it wouldn't be a problem at all. In a surprisingly short time, he'd managed to pull up the room number for her gear, produced and filled out a dozen or so arcane requisition forms, and led the way out to the final security checkpoint between us and the facility proper. This second checkpoint hadn't been on the interrogator's plans, but that was understandable given it looked like it had been set up within the last few days. It wasn't much, just a single stormtrooper with a clipboard, and a senior looking scribe sitting at a desk covered with dormant servo skulls. We watched as our scribe rolled forward and a sort of bureaucratic arm wrestling match began, with a lot of arguing about the difference between a release order and a disposal order, and why our request didn't violate some sort of freeze. For his part, the stormtrooper eyed us, and casually asked why we were all wearing scarves. There was a brief moment of panic, during which Sarge mentally ran through all of the vague excuses we'd come up with, before finally shrugging and just raising the edge of his scarf to expose the discipline collar, and announcing that we were wearing them because our inquisitor was a massive asshole. The stormtrooper winced in sympathy, but then frowned and pointed out that he only had authorization to let through active HQ troopers, and he would need to verify our credentials. Sarge began to proffer his doctor died card hoping like hell that Tink had done as good a job on them as he'd claimed, but the stormtrooper waved them away and asked the pair of arguing scribes whether the sicker had come back from the bathroom yet. Fortunately, the answer to that question was no, or more precisely, a sarcastic eye roll and a gesture at the general sicker-lessness of the area. The stormtrooper muttered something, and leaned over to the desk's intercom, and was rewarded with a pained voice telling him yeah yeah, but which massive arsehole to our collective relief Sarge actually managed not to blurt Rogue Inquisitor Oak, but his decision to stand there silently panicking wasn't that much of an improvement. Fortunately, before any of us decided to try our hands at bullshitting past a sicker, our scribe helpfully suggested that if we could describe our inquisitor, they could help us remember their name. Seizing the opportunity, all of us began rattling of a list of the most generic descriptors possible from paranoid bastard who doesn't tell his subordinates anything to self-important jackass who thinks everyone else is too stupid to brief, and with a brief diversion into tells your mom you got sent to a penal legion. All of these were accepted with the blank stares of people waiting for you to finish stating the obvious, until Nubby suggested big stupid hat, and all three of them abruptly nodded, while the indisposed sicker swore at us for wasting his time and hung up. As the stormtrooper waved us through the door, he suggested that next time we start with the inquisitor who's already here, doing the pre-trial inventory on the oak case. As infiltrations of top secret inquisitorial facilities went, it was safe to say that we'd achieved the title of most half asset. Honestly, we'd been grilled harder by stingy quartermasters, and TAU ones at that, but we weren't going to look a gift critter in the orifice, at least not without a good pair of gloves. That said, we did still try to pry some information out of the scribe as he and the servo skull led us through the massive grid of corridors, but there was something about the place that seemed to discourage conversation. The walls just sort of drank in sound, making it hard to do more than nod along as the scribe nattered about how the recent servitor recall had made such a mess of things. In fact, according to the scribe, the facility was so short on manpower they'd been trying to get the penal legion to assign a few details to help inside as well as outside, but they hadn't been able to get the security authorization. 
dock broken, and asked whether Amy's assigned penal detachment could have come in with her under her security, and the rest of us groaned at the realization that we probably could have just walked in without any of the stupid disguise or laundry stuff. At least the helpful old scribe was able to authorize the return of Amy's legionnaires, actually printing out a little form from an augmetic in his chair, and handing it to Amy with a cheerful suggestion that she just take it to the guards on the freight exit instead of bothering the main security office. The door our guide skull led us to was a little smaller and lower security than most of the ones we'd seen. It was only the three stormtroopers with a cargo pallet that set it apart. They seemed surprised to see us, boggling slightly at the sight of the snoring commissar, but straightened up when the scribe asked them what they were doing. After a short awkward pause, one of them explained that they had a disposal order for the room, and handed over a data slot. The scribe looked at it for a few seconds, announced he saw the problem, and promised to get it all sorted out. He instructed the trio to come with him and began rolling off down the hallway, only to sheepishly roll back and open the door for us when Ting called after him. None of us had really known what to expect inside an inquisitorial evidence storeroom, but the reality was worse than we could have ever imagined. There were boxes, shelves, filing cabinets, and bins, all packed together more densely than any functionally sane human would want, but up above them was something terrible. Rows upon rows of metal racks reached all the way to the ceiling. Every centimeter of them festooned with bulging opaque plastic wafers, each one containing a single vacuum sealed item. Our entire arsenal, not to mention our tools, personal effects, several reams of parking tickets, and what looked to be several dozen empty beer bottles, had been clamshelled. The scribe handed Amy a battered data wand, hastily explaining the litanies of identification and deactivation, and stressing the importance of not removing or breaking the seal on any item that hadn't been deactivated first. With a friendly direction towards the nearest supply closet, where cutting implements and first aid kits could be found, he rolled off. Tink grabbed the wand, and hesitantly poked the little electronic seal on one of the corners. A hologram of a MRE appeared, along with a brief description, ID code, access log, and a little menu which Tink carefully navigated. The rest of us watched with growing impatience as the techie confirmed that he was sure he wanted to access the item, that he had read and understood the legal ramifications of accessing it, that he wanted to remove the item, that he'd read and understood the legal ramifications of removing it, and that he didn't want to review all those documents again which summed up the general mood with series of dire curses on all bureaucrats. By the time Tink had the first few randomly selected items deactivated, and a pair of scissors had been fetched, broken, and abandoned in favor of Sarge's augmetic hand, it was obvious that this was going to take far longer than we had time for. Everyone but Tink, and the old commissar, who'd been wedged under the racks at the far wall, began searching the racks and boxes for the real necessities. The room's small floor space was ankle deep in vacuum sealed junk when Nubby, having climbed through the racks to the back of the room, triumphantly chucked out a distinctly lasgan shaped package. Not just any lasgan mind you, an oversized, blocky looking, totally not techno heretical lasgan. The realization that Oak had included our gear from the occurrence border boosted the mood massively, and Tink began excitedly badgering Nubby to try and find if Spot 3.0 had been included too. Sarge broke in to remind them guns, ammo, and combeds first, and informed the rest of us that there wasn't time for everyone to sit around here. He, Amy, and Twitch would go off and scout for Oak's locker as soon as they were armed, and would return once it had been located to get their collars off and plan the switch. Doc would stay behind with Nubby and Tink to supervise the search for Oak's boxes, and make sure the old commissar didn't wake up and cause trouble. As soon as Amy had changed into our last stormtrooper uniform, three weapons and the grenade Twitch insisted on having had all been extracted, and two combeds had been found, the scouting team set off. Tink immediately redirected Nubby to find his personal stuff first, ignoring Doc's objections, because everything would be so much faster once he'd found his data slot. Doc had barely even started grumpily going through the stacks of boxes when Tink extracted said slate, and triumphantly plugged it into the data slot Amy had left with him. Amy's data slot, now elevated to the full authority of a commissar, not only supplied the Ides of Oak's boxes, which were in the far corner from where Doc had been searching, but finally unlocked those damn collars. 
the medic, feeling relieved, it's about as useful and appreciated as a Catalchin commissar, decided that was his cue to go do something more useful, and headed off with his penal legion assistance authorization form to go get some more hands. With the annoying voice of reason out of the way, Tink and Nubby extracted the techie's plasma gun, and the unpackaging process became significantly faster, if rather foul-smelling. Admittedly, this completely violated all those directions the scribe had given us, but when the first one didn't trigger any alarms, Tink had declared it all a bunch of horseshit. It wasn't until a light started flashing above the door that it occurred to either of the pair to check whether the room had a fire detector, but fortunately it appeared to just be some sort of minor warning which quickly shut itself off as the room's air circulation automatically activated. Unfortunately the old commissar was less forgiving, coughing and grumbling in a distinctly non tranked not to mention exceedingly annoying, fashion. After the third outburst, Tink announced that enough was enough, especially now that we'd gotten out of the collars, and directed Nubby to dig the old geezer out and take him somewhere less distracting, like one of the servitor storage rooms just down the corner. Nubby began to argue about being ordered around, but decided a little walkabout would be nice, anything to get him out of the cramped little fume filled room faster really. A fair distance away, the scouting team was making some sort of progress. The duplicated eyed cards were working to get them through the security doors at every junction, if a bit slower than things had been with the guide skull, and there were enough other skull less stormtroopers walking around that they didn't really stand out. The problem was that while they had the eye number 4 oaks room, which Sarge had memorized using a marker and his forearm, there wasn't any sort of directory, or even organization at all as far as Sarge and Amy could tell. Twitch insisted there was a pattern though, one which he was on the edge of understanding, if they would just let him study the problem. Fully aware that Twitch had also said this about his breakfast cereal on multiple occasions, but lacking any better ideas, Sludge and Amy fell into step behind the demo trooper, several minutes of back and forth semi-random wandering, and an awkward number of references to Sludge's forearm. Later, Twitch led the trio to a junction door with a terminally bored stormtrooper sitting in front of it. The stormtrooper didn't look up from the data slit he was holding as they approached, just boredly announcing that the junction's card readers were still broken, and they should just detour around it. Before anyone could stop him, Twitch triumphantly poked a finger at the man, accusing him of being one of them. The stormtrooper looked up in surprise, did a double take at Sarge, and hastily shoved the slate into his pocket and came to a very embarrassed attention. Sarge shrugged in his best I've got other shit to deal with manner as the man muttered about only watching it for the battle scenes and dragged Twitch out before he could make things any weirder. At Twitch's insistence, the scout patrol continued around the grid to the other side of the junction, turning up two more terminally bored stormtroopers, before arriving at the final connected corridor, where a pair of far more professional looking stormtroopers blocked the way. Before anyone could think to stop him, the demo trooper walked up to the pair, and asked if Oak's shit was through there. He got a silent nod. Twitch asked if Inquisitor Big Hat was still there, and got a snort from the second trooper to go along with another silent nod. Twitch turned to Sludge and Amy with a triumphant finger guns, and raised the question of what to do next. Sarge turned, trying to avoid faceplate contact with the two guards, while poking his combat in an attempt to raise Tink. After a few seconds of frustrating silence, he pulled the headset off, checked its indicators, which were all green and started checking the other channels to see if he could hear anything on any of them. He stopped on the main stormtrooper band, listening to the calming chatter of patrol check-ins, and then shrugged and announced that Tink's combed must be on the fritz. He began to suggest that we just get on with things as planned, when the door abruptly opened to reveal one of those incredibly creepy flying cherub servitors. One of the guards announced that the Inquisitor was ready for us, and motioned for us to follow the creepy thing. Tink and Amy stared in shock, but Sarge just nodded and motioned for the pair to follow him into the hallway. As it turned out, Oak's case did not have a room. It had the entire damn hall, both sides, and the pre-trial inventory was in full swing. The hall was littered with pallets, boxes, stormtroopers, of both the half-acid and rod-acid varieties, and at least a dozen scribes with data wands and slates moving between the rooms. The only thing absent were the guide skulls, having all been replaced by horrible flying cyber babies with inquisitorial icons stapled to them. 
Twitch quietly pointed out that anyone creepy enough to use cherub servitors should automatically be considered a heretic. Amy nodded in fervent agreement, and Sarge suggested that this really was not the time or place for that sort of discussion. The cherub led them to the largest door in the hall, a void shielded high security job with wards all over it. In front of the door was a harassed looking man in a big dumb hat, waving a servitor control wand around and berating a random scribe. The Inquisitor, because there's no way he wasn't one, looked up in vague surprise as the group approached, and waved the scribe away. Sarge, lacking any better ideas, saluted and then stood there, while Twitch and Amy watched and tried not to panic. The Inquisitor stared at Sarge for a second, and then waved his wand at the big door and ordered the three to follow him in. Inside the room, more of it all really, things were a lot less busy. There were a few elderly scribes off at a table on the side, along with a far younger scribe watching them. In the middle of the room, another young scribe as well as a pair of elderly inquisitorial savant types and a trio of cherubs fussed over a collection of clamshelled items and three familiar looking empty boxes. In the far corner, a final young scribe sat muttering into a large vox unit. Once the door was closed, the Inquisitor's demeanor immediately changed, and he gruffly demanded Sarge's report on what he'd found in the Von Humperding girl's vault. Back at said vault, Doc returned with penal legion helpers in tow. The stormtroopers working the freight bay had objected to him bringing in the trainees, but only because they'd been doing a great job of hauling stuff to the incinerator, and none of the troopers were keen on going back to doing it themselves. They'd bowed in the face of Doc's little printed form though, and reluctantly allowed their helpers to head inside, along with several empty pallets and one laundry hamper full of fresh minced commissar. Bringing the group through the facility hadn't been a particular problem either, except for the part right at the end, where Doc encountered Nubby trying to jam the sleeping old commissar into the tiny supply closet across the hall. Doc sent the trainees in to start helping Tink, and went off to supervise Nubby's drunk commissar storage project. The cretinous little trooper whined that he checked every door he had access to, and the small supply closet was the only one even remotely acceptable. Doc pointed out that, even if Nubby did manage to fit the commissar into it, the massive pile of office supplies he'd emptied out of it were a bit of a giveaway, not to mention what would happen if anyone else needed to come get an easily broken pair of scissors. Nubby insisted that the other rooms he checked were actually worse, for some unspecified reason, but grudgingly grabbed the commissar's pallet, and followed Doc down the hall to recheck those servitor storage and maintenance rooms. A few minutes later, Tink looked up from where he'd been supervising the extraction of Oak's boxes, as Doc and Nubby returned and started shoveling freshly opened weapons, explosives, and res into the commissar's lap in an attempt to make space in the decidedly crowded little room. Tink was not happy with the return of this distraction, especially when Doc and Nubby couldn't really explain what was wrong with all the other rooms, just waving their hands and going on about how they'd checked and the rooms were unacceptable. The trainees butted in, pointing out that having him there wasn't really that much of an inconvenience, especially now that the ventilation was on full blast, but the techie insisted that it would ruin his nice efficient process. Tink ordered the trainees to finish opening the items he'd already deactivated, he refused to leave his plasma gun with them, on the grounds that they'd probably break it, and then let Doc, Nubby, and the commissar pallet out into the hallway. The argument continued in the hallway for a minute, with both Nubby and Doc insisting that the only other remotely acceptable option was the little supply closet. Tink, agreeing about the stupidity of the little closet, but still trying to ascertain what exactly was so damn wrong with his previous drunk commissar storage suggestions, finally yelled at Nubby and Doc to just show him and grabbed the commissar's pallet. A short walk brought the trio back to the door of the servitor storage bay, where Nubby rolled his eyes, jimmied the door, looked in, and then made a little aha gesture. Dada it was it we cold and shove I may cause it's all full up with naked dead guys Tink surveyed the room, with its tight rows of servitor berths inexplicably filled with what looked like naked stormtroopers and a few scribes. After a few seconds of pondering, Tink pointed out there was still plenty of room if they just shoved them all up in a pile against the far wall. Doc explained that he'd already thought of that, and the problem was that only a few of them were actually dead. Wouldn't do to have them wake up and start asking questions about why people were shoving commissars in there with them. Also, Nubby added, it would be super unhygienic and a lot of work. Tink nodded in reluctant agreement with their sound logic, 
and began to turn the pallet back around, only to abruptly stop partway, nearly sliding its snoring cargo off, and ask what was wrong with the other room. Doc and Nubby both looked at each other, obviously waiting for the other to explain, until Nubby finally made a little apathetic shrugging gesture. He walked up the door labeled Servitor Maintenance and Control Shrine 4 and knocked on it. Tink watched, slightly nonplussed, as an annoyed looking man in robes opened the door and firmly stated that no means no, not even if they asked pretty please or promised he wouldn't wake up, not to mention throw up Doc immediately apologized and began offering tips on cleaning bodily fluids out of clothing, but stopped as the man made a little gesture and touched the glowing crystals on the ore and necklace he wore. Tink peeked behind the sicker, surveying the impressive little cogitator array that had been wired into the building's main control and communication systems. He paused for a second, looking from the cogitator, to the sicker, to the closed servitor bay, and then back to Doc and Nubby. Okay, so we can't put the commissar in that one because there's a bunch of stripped stormtroopers already hidden there. Doc and Nubby both nodded, while the sicker rolled his eyes and made a get along with it gesture. And we can't put him in this one because this guy is already using it for his secret inquisitorial mission. More nods and eye rolling. And that supply closet was way too small. Unless I make it bigger that as Tink raised his plasma gun. And both Doc and Nubby nodded at this novel out of the box solution. The sicker winced. And touched his crystals again. And all three guardsmen deflated as they realized that there were probably a lot of reasons why cutting holes in the wall with a Zenitech plasma weapon was a bad idea. Tink paused, double checking that incongruous thought, and then sighed. You know, if I had a throne for every time we blundered into another inquisitorial team mid-mission, I'd only have two, which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it's happened twice. Doc laughed. Nubby laughed. The sicker blinked. Tink shot the sicker. Of course. Now the problem was that, as Nubby put it, dear's dead sicker juice everywhere. Tink nodded in resigned agreement, admitting that it really wasn't the sort of place to linger in, you know, in case they caught dead sicceritus or something. Down on the floor, Doc finished putting a dressing on the definitely dead sicker's chest wound, and blinked a few times. As Tink and Nubby wheeled the commissar out, Doc jogged after them, grabbed one of the pulse carbines off the pallet, and shot the sicker again, in the head this time, and then dragged the techie back in to take a look at the cogitator setup. Nubby remained in the hallway with the commissar, insisting he had a family history of dead sickeritus. In a room full of not dead sickers, Sarge delivered an exceedingly precise report of the contents of Amy's vault, to wit. Parking tickets, guns, explosives, beer bottles, and more parking tickets. After nearly a minute of this, the Inquisitor held up a hand and clarified that he wanted to know what had happened and why Sarge was here. Sarge winced at the feedback in his combat, both from the irate Inquisitor and the poorly disguised sicker muttering in the corner, then reached up and turned the stupid thing off. Ignoring the Inquisitor's raised eyebrow, Sludge truthfully reported that Cadet Commissar Von Humperdig arrived to collect her stuff, and, they'd, uh, come here, because orders. Amy and Twitch shared a look of growing alarm, but the Inquisitor only sighed and asked Sarge why he wasn't wearing a sea shield. The answer, because we weren't issued any, did not seem to please the man. He glared at Sarge, which didn't really have much effect given the faceplate. The inquisitorial glowering was interrupted by a shrill beep from under Sarge's scarf, prompting further demands as to why he was wearing a scarf, why said scarf was beeping, and where his sea shield was. Sarge, still standing at a firm attention, got as far as because, before the inquisitor held up a hand and declared that he really did not care, in an exasperated tone, depressingly familiar to us from our previous missions, he directed Sarge to turn around go back to Amy's vault, and stay there until the interrogator shows up, as had been outlined in the mission briefing, and then to go get a damned sea shield. Sarge, Amy, and Tink, thanking the sweet merciful emperor, saluted as the inquisitor strode past them to reopen the door. Those thanks came to an abrupt halt as the door opened to reveal three familiar looking stormtroopers, one of them with their hand raised to knock. The Inquisitor figured out what had happened far more quickly than anyone else, which didn't really help him much, since Sarge, 
Twitch, and Amy didn't waste any time at all on such silliness, they just opened fire. Two fully automatic pulse carbines, and a double tap from Amy's rifle hit the Inquisitor, and then kept going as the man vanished with a distinctive crack of a displacer field. The three pseudo stormtroopers behind the man did not have displacer fields, or time to dodge for that matter. Unfortunately, this abrupt opening didn't account for the dozen or two other stormtroopers present, and even more unfortunately, the Inquisitor stuck his landing. A booming voice infused with cyclic will, ordered the three guardsmen to drop their weapons. Sarge, along with half the stormtroopers present, abruptly dropped their guns, as did Twitch, along with the grenade he'd just primed. A desperate kick caught the falling munition, propelling it off the far wall and out of sight down the hall roughly in the direction which the Inquisitor's voice had come from. Amy did not drop her weapon, because she'd already let go of it as she ran for the door's control panel, slamming the massive metal vault shut on a muffled crump and anguished my leg sludge and twitch recaptured their weapons from their slings, while Amy mashed every single alarm and lock button on the panel, and asked Sarge just what the hell we were supposed to do now. Fortunately for the big, tired noncom the answer was obvious, because right about then the two sevens got over their shock and started screaming at their sickers to kill us. Actually, what the sevens were yelling was a bunch of gibberish thrown washes talon stuff, but the intent was pretty clear as the three young scribes all sat bolt upright and turned to glare at us. The fact that they were sickers was also pretty clear, what with the nimbus of warpy energy forming around the one in the corner, and the one at the table levitating up into the air. The real clincher though was when the one over by the actual scribes abruptly turned into a demonic horror the likes of which man was not meant to see, a towering flickering mass of mouths and all seeing eyes, the sort of monstrosity that could not be fought, only fled in a futile attempt to postpone the inevitable grizzy end. We shot it anyway though, because what else were we supposed to do whatever the sicker thought was going to happen, it wasn't three guardsmen panic firing Zenitech plasma weapons in an enclosed area, when Sludge and Twitch ran out of ammo all that was left of the sicker, not to mention the chair, table, half a shelving unit, and one of the hypnotized scribe's arms, was a smoldering stain on the vault floor. The two remaining sickers and their savant handlers all stared in utter shock, which was finally broken as Amy realized she still had a few shots left, and promptly shot one of the savants. The remaining old man drew a needle pistol and leapt for cover, screaming more command phrases and gesturing with the data wand in his free hand. Sergeant Twitch both ducked as all three chair observators swarmed them, prodding at their faces and hands with miniature shock mauls while screeching and laughing in a far more disturbing way than the faux demon had managed. Sarge, cursing whatever had possessed him to come down here without his full kit, or at least a damn sidearm, tried to swat away the cherubs with his guns but while Twitch desperately tried to reload, he expanded that cursing to include his decision to leave the damn collar on, as the device in question suddenly progressed from beeps to warning shocks. Twitch added his own swears as his collar kicked in two and he dropped his reload. Realizing she was the only one with a functional weapon at present, Amy fell back into cover and lined up a shot on one of the cherubs, only to miss entirely as an invisible force wrenched her pulse rifle upwards. The markswoman, having just gotten her damn gun back and being none too keen on losing it again, tightened her grip on the bucking weapon. The telekine sicker grunted and pulled harder, until the pulse rifle finally rose over the top of the shelves, with an irate Amy dangling under it, loudly promising to shoot him in his stupid sicker face the second he let go. Sarge missed the magical levitating Mark's woman, at first because he was a little busy trying to fend off the cherubs, and then because his mind abruptly went blank. Across the room, the sicker by the Vox unit let out a groan of distress as several decades of literally guard issue battle damage way down on his psyche, followed by a sharp electric shock to the neck. Sarge flinched and swore at his damn collar, and then blinked as he registered the, thankfully still empty, gun he had pointed at Twitch's head. Any introspection that might have happened after coming this close to fucking up was postponed as one of the cherubs whacked him right in the faceplate with its mini maul. Sarge swore yet again, dropped his weapon onto its sling, and just grabbed the annoying little shit out of the air by a decoratively flapping wing, and swung it into one of its companions in a spray of feathers and servitor lubricant. Twitch, having finally succeeded in reloading, turned to take out the last cherub, only for his mind to go blank as well. 
Sarge, being gratifyingly quick on the uptake for a change, managed to grab the mind puppeted demo trooper's weapon and yank the barrel upwards just in time. Twitch responded by repeatedly attempting to shank him with a sharpened fork, but didn't manage to penetrate the armor before his collar activated again and the sicker released him with a pained yelp. A good 3 meters above all this, Amy's death grip on her weapon carried her over the top of one of the shelving units, as well as the rather surprised Savant using it as cover. Rather than wait for the elderly man to shoot her like so much skeet, the markswoman twisted her body around and planted both feet against the side of a heavy looking box and kicked off as hard as she could. The box, proving even heavier than it looked, barely even shifted. The shelving unit on the other hand, the savant let out a little screech of terror and sprinted along the aisle, throwing himself to the ground as the shelves finally slammed into their neighbor, pushing it over as well and leaving him in a small gap full of falling clamshell casings. Amy surveyed the carnage as a third set of shelves began to teeter, and found herself drifting off into a sort of peaceful doze. She didn't even realize she'd let go of her weapon until the strap caught her in the armpit, abruptly jerking her attention back to the present. Amy twisted around to glare at the telepathic sicker by the Vox unit, and after a brief survey of the available options, grabbed her stormtrooper helmet and hucked it at him. Twitch put down the remaining cherub just as soon as he'd convinced Sarge it was really him, and could he have his gun back now pretty please he started to shift left down the aisle while Sarge reloaded his own weapon and moved right, and drew up to the end of the unit right as the badly shaken Savant flung himself around the corner, ready to flank the two men his sicker and cherubs had tied down. Twitch made a sound somewhere between a scream and a yelp, and flinched backwards as bits of Savant skull shrapnel pinged off his faceplate. At the other end of the aisle, Sludge ignored the weird sounds behind him as he spotted the glowing telepath sicker seated at the Vox unit in the far corner of the room. His carefully aimed shot missed as a ballistic helmet whacked the young man in the face, dropping him to the floor, swearing some more, especially as the collar shocked him again. The noncom sprinted down the aisle, confirmed the kill, and turned to try and get a shot at the remaining sicker, the telecon, a girl even younger than Fumbles who insisted he was 23, abruptly realized that shit had gone truly south, and released a psychic shockwave that blew Sarge, Twitch, the scribes, and several shelves backwards. Amy was also hit by this blast, but true to her word, the second the markswoman's rifle was released from its psychic grip, she turned, drew a bead on the sicker midair, and dropped the girl with a solid center of mass shot, having spared rather less attention for her landing, not to mention the psychic shockwave. Amy swore as she bounced off two fallen shelving units, caught her leg on one of them, and found herself hanging upside down staring at the terrified and confused scribes. One of them raised their hand like a kid in school, and asked what was going on. In accordance with the laws of narrative causality, at precisely the moment when the Inquisitor had said until the interrogator shows up, a sallow-skinned young man and his two companions asked Nubby what he was doing standing in hallway with a pallet full of unconscious commissars and odd-looking energy weapons. Corporal Nubby Nubs, Inquisitorial Stormtrooper, saluted and proudly told the pale young man with the sicker staff that he was keeping watch while his mates Doc and Tink checked out da sicker closet. The interrogator groaned, and motioned at one of his retainers to inspect the room. Doc and Tink looked up from the cogitator unit as the door opened, framing a dark, live blur sprinting towards them. The medic reacted first, fumbling for his carbine, only for a hand to yank it out of his grasp and pull him forwards into what felt like a power hammer blow to the chest. Tink got to watch as Doc got kicked past him with enough force to break his weapon strap, and then his own weapon was yanked forwards dragging him out of his seat face first into the plasma gun's butt. A slightly nasal feminine voice complained. He got himself shot in the damn face by these idiots. And I think this one with the fancy gun might be a fracking officer. Doc and Tink tried. They really, really did. Despite the broken ribs, Doc managed to get back up and launch a tackle at the body-suited woman, who, to be fair, wasn't even looking at him, only for her to slap him in the face hard enough to shatter his faceplate and leave the stunned medic in a heap on the floor. Tink made a grab for his gun while she was busy, and got smashed in the face with its butt again for his trouble. Outside, the interrogator casually reminded the woman not to kill anyone while he focused on psychically examining inquisitorial stormtrooper nubs. 
the interrogator's other retainer, a tall lean man in a comically fancy coat and feathered hat, flipped up Nubby's visor to compare it against his security badge, and immediately regretted his decision. In a tone of horrified fascination, he pointed out that either the HQ stormtroopers were really scraping the bottom of the barrel, or the Ordas Xenos had started doing diversity hires. The interrogator frowned at this observation, while Nubby happily explained that he'd never been to Noversity, but was great at scraping things. The fancy Aristo sneered and moved on to examining the snoring commissar, companionably pointing out that at least the interrogator didn't have to dirty his mind on that wreck of humanity. The interrogator shuddered and shook his head as the short trooper excavated one of his nostrils, examined his findings, and ate them. After a brief disgusted pause, he told his minion to shut up and go check on the Von Hamperding vault. The squad of penal trainees didn't even look up as the door opened, being far too busy looking in literally any other direction. The Aristo surveyed the scene for a few seconds, before closing the door again and asking whether anyone would miss a unit of penal legionnaires if they spontaneously disappeared. The interrogator grunted in psychic effort and the man hurriedly closed the door again. After a few seconds of silent probing, he declared that the legionnaires had been officially approved by someone or other, so they'd have to disappear the records too. The two men began debating whether it would be easier to kill, incapacitate, or just mind fog the legionnaires while they investigated the vault for anything oak related. In the dead sicker closet, Tink and Doc had decided staying down was the better part of Vela, especially since the woman had finally gotten tired of re-breaking Tink's nose with the plasma gun, and was now holding it trained on the pair. Both guardsmen weighed their severely limited options, and lacking anything better, settled in to wait and see what happened next. That turned out to be the distant crump of a grenade, followed by several runes flashing red on the fancy cogitator setup. The woman stared in confusion at the mysterious blinking lights, Doc and Tink, having spent enough time poking at the thing to know that it was hooked up to the building's alarm system, decided the time had come for one last try. Tink leapt at the woman, while Doc went for the cogitator. Realizing what was going on fairly quickly, she whipped the plasma gun towards Doc and pulled the trigger, and then stared in consternation as the gun emitted a short blue beam instead of a ball of plasma. Responding in the standard imperial fashion for a warrior beset by unexpected weapon malfunctions, she raised her hand and gave the gun a good smack. Also responding in the standard imperial fashion, the plasma gun vented a blast of superheated gas directly into her face. Tink's tackle hit the woman roughly half a second later, his first successful hit of the fight, and while he didn't do more than stagger her, he did manage to get both hands on his beloved plasma gun. The blind leg sweep she responded with hit his shins with considerably more force, as well with an unpleasant cracking sound. Doc ignored the fight going on behind him in favor of desperately searching for the cogitor for some sort of approve button, deciding it either had to be the yellow check mark or the green circle. He simply mashed both of them, and was rewarded with the sound of every vox in the building simultaneously blaring the fire, weapons discharge, and emergency lockdown alarms. Out in the hall, the distant grenade blast interrupted the interrogator and his minion. Both men paused to listen as their combeds erupted into confused chatter, until this was interrupted in turn by the deafening blare of the facility's alarms. The interrogator swore, tightening his mental control on the short stormtrooper in the room full of penal legionnaires. The elderly commissar, not being under psychic compulsion or adequately tranked anymore, jerked awake, looked around in vague confusion and spotted a pale little tit with an inquisitorial rosette standing right next to the pallet with his eyes closed. With the malicious grin of someone who'd always wanted to do this, he hefted his empty bottle and smashed it into the man's skull. Sadly, the commissar didn't have quite the same level of strength as, say, Sarge, so the interrogator didn't have his head caved in, but he did drop to the ground with a little yelp of pain. Needless to say, the interrogator did not take this kindly. A concentrated blast of psychic pain left the old commissar squealing and flailing in his chair, much to the surprise of the no longer mind-controlled Nubby next to him. With the honed survival instincts of a true cretin, Nubby responded to the complex tactical situation by screaming, kicking the downed interrogator in the stomach, grabbing one of the weapons falling off the commissar's lap, and diving for cover behind the man's chair. The aristocrat, viewing the whole situation with growing alarm, drew a comically small needle pistol, and asked his superior if he needed assistance. 
The interrogator instructed him to do something anatomically improbable, which he seemed to take as an order to start flanking Nubby's position. Sinai the Nubby or the interrogator waited for the flanking maneuver. The interrogator staggered to his feet, gesturing at Nubby in appropriately Sikawai fashion, only to screech in surprise as the little trooper lunged out of cover, brandishing a silenced auto pistol, abandoning his cyclic attack. The man scrambled around the pallet barely ahead of a series of bangs, desperately trying to keep the bulk of writhing commissar between him and his assailant, and shouting warnings and instructions at the area's toe. For his part, the dapper man picked his way through the detritus of half-packed crates, and pointed out that Nubby's gun hadn't actually been loaded. A slightly panicked voice from the far side of the commissar informed him that it was totally, definitely, 100% loaded, and was just silenced. The Aristo asked why he'd been shouting bang then, and was rewarded with the little trooper poking out his auto pistol and yelling for whip instead. The interrogator sighed in embarrassment, and made another, uninterrupted psychic gesture. A short distance away, a very angry woman with plasma burns on her face stopped trying to dislodge the flailing, screaming tink from the malfunctioning plasma gun, and just dropped both of them to the floor. Doc, knowing exactly what was coming next, scrambled away from the cogitator and tried to hide behind one of the servitor maintenance stations, only for a vice-like grip to close on his ankle and yank him out with enough force to fling the medic against the far wall. Her follow-up attack was interrupted as Tink switched the homemade fire selector on his plasma gun from cut to maximal and shot her in the back. Amazingly, the woman actually managed to spin in place and parry Tink's shot with her hand. While whatever mixture of augmentics, training, and magical bullshit that powered the woman's melee abilities was enough to deflect bullets, an overcharged ball of plasma capable of melting holes through tank armor, was a bit of a tall order. Her hand didn't so much knock the plasma ball aside, as splash it, breathing her whole arm in blue flame, scorching through her body glove, and reducing her hand to a fused, smoldering mass. Doc, seeing an opportunity but having no illusions about the woman's ability to beat his ass literally one-handed, scrambled past the screaming, swearing, burning woman, and dove for the corner where his pulse carbine had landed at the start of the fight, displaying far more tactical sense than usual for an inquisition agent. Instead of chasing the medic, the woman started sprinting for the door. Tink, lying squarely in her path, brandished his plasma gun, realized it was obviously still recharging and desperately tried to drag himself out of her way, barely dodging the kick the woman aimed at his head as she passed. Out in the hallway, Commissar Kelly swore as the ice pick of psychic pain jammed into his brain pulsed with, upon reflection, not that much more discomfort than his more or less permanent hangover. It wasn't pleasant mind you, but really, it was a bit much to call it incapacitating. With an effort of will, the elderly commissar brought his eyes and a decent portion of his mind into focus, and leaned forward to rummage in the pile of weapons in his lap. Next to his chair, the interrogator grunted with effort as Nubby marched out of cover. The grimy little trooper handed the unloaded auto pistol into the interrogator's waiting hand, while the commissar jammed his decidedly loaded last pistol into the interrogator's waiting face. The aristocratic inquisitorial agent, having successfully navigated the battle without getting shot at, and very proud of that fact, screamed in surprise as his superior's head detonated in a spray of flaming skull fragments and meaty bits. There was a brief pause as the Aristo took in the abruptly changed combat situation and a confused nubby picked up the fallen auto pistol and tried to jam it back into the corpse's nerveless hand. Then the commissar spotted him. The barrage of Les pistol fire had more in the way of enthusiasm than accuracy, but it was enough to convince the Aristo that it was time to take some cover. A panicked scramble left him crouched down behind one of the half-empty boxes littering the hall trying to draw a bead on the furiously cursing commissar, but flinching back with every poorly aimed LAS shot. A little behind him, the door to Amy's vault slid open and the confused face of a penal legionnaire poked out, jerked back in, and then leaned back out again, this time accompanied by four more faces, as well as five lasguns. After a few seconds of watching, and one uncomfortably close miss in their direction, the former PDF trooper cleared his throat, and asked what was going on here. The Aristo blinked, laughed nervously, and immediately held up his hands. On the opposite side of the commissar, a smoldering, cursing blur flew out of the dead sicker closet, screaming for someone to throw her a weapon so she could kill these frackheads. 
Grinning in sudden relief, the Aristo continued his upward motion, smoothly rising to his feet and tossing his as yet and fired needle pistol toward his companion. Four of the five Lasgans pointed at the man and started moving, tracking the arc of the thrown pistol, which landed in the woman's remaining hand at roughly the same time as the better part of 12 LAS shots hit her in the torso. The Aristo stared slack jawed as his companion crumpled to the floor, where a bolt of plasma and a burst of pulse fire from the closet doorway reduced what was left to a smoking, steaming wreck. He turned back to the doorway full of penal legionnaires, directing the majority of his attention to the former PDF trooper who still had him covered, and tried to think of something really persuasive to say. Behind him the commissar finished reloading, took careful aim, and shot him in the head too. Down on the floor, Nubby gave up his attempts to hand over his auto pistol to the dead interrogator, looked around at the carnage, and announced he was not it for telling Sarge. As it turned out, Tink was it, since he was the one who finally got the combats working. The techie's broken shins had been splinted, and he'd been given stim from Doc's recently recovered field aid kit, which was enough to get him propped upright at the dead sick as cogitator. What really got Tink moving though, was the sight of a trainee unpacking spot 3.0, complete with Grok's skull disguise and a little cartoon demon folk kill marker etched next to the one of the Bong Elder. Rather than sit and figure out the cogitator's functions like a sane person, Tink had, giggling, ripped out several data feeds and hooked both the cogitator and inquisitorial facilities security systems directly into his techno-heretical Xenos toy. The mayhem was instantaneous. There were more alarms, of course, after so long aboard the occurrence border they barely registered anymore, but that was nothing compared to the deafening babble of every comb channel in the facility rebooting into full unjammed and unsickered functionality. This included the private channel used by the other Inquisition team as it turned out, which combined with the gunfire, explosions, and assorted security alerts coming from Oak's vault, was enough to throw pretty much the entire facility into confused chaos. Our comb channel, through the techno magic of live kernel patching, was rerouted through Spot the Wonder Drone. The fact that Sarge was actually glad to hear Tink's voice spoke volumes. The overall tactical situation was a mess. Sarge, Amy, and Twitch, aided by the scribes they'd rescued, had managed to hold their position in Oak's primary vault. The big vault door and its inbuilt void shield had held for a while. But it wasn't long before someone on the outside managed to bypass the door's controls, only to find a giant pile of clamshell junk, overturned shelving units, random boxes, and the odd sicker corpse blocking their way. Combined with the firing slits manned, or woman given it was Amy doing most of the work, by us and the more enthusiastic scribes, the hostiles hadn't managed to make any real progress before the arrival of the facility's actual security forces distracted them said hostiles had coordinated a defense, involving both mundane and sicker assets, vastly aided by their control of the security systems and the lack of functional comb channels, at least until Tink pulled off his little trick. All in all, Sarge's team would have been in a great position, if it weren't for the fact that his and Twitch's collars had more or less incapacitated them, and were making some very worrying imminent detonation indicating beeps. Team Doc was in a better position, if worse shape given Tink's broken legs, Doc's broken ribs, and Nubby's rather hazy mental state after the repeated psychic attacks. The trainees had all come through the fiasco unscathed, and were unloading the room at a rapid rate now that Tink had announced that there was no point worrying about setting off alarms. In short order everyone was armed and equipped, Oak's special boxes had been extracted, and the only questions left were who to send to relieve Sarge's team, and unfortunately, what to do with the commissar. Our valiant commissar, unironically, given the man's recent kill count, was not only awake, but borderline coherent as well. A hurried, semi-factual explanation that we were here to collect Amy's stuff, but had been ambushed by inquisitorial traitors, was accepted readily enough. As was our insistence that it had all been his idea, including the part where three of us were disguised as HQ stormtroopers. The sticking point was the man's insistence on not only participating in, but leading some sort of sortie and killing more of those fancy rosette sucking bastards, as well as rescuing Amy, and her nice tits. Also his refusal to give up either his loose pistol or bottle. Combined with Tink's broken legs and insistence that he needed to stay at the cogitator, the decision was quickly reached to allow the commissar his little adventure, if only to get his commissarial data slots in range of Sergeant Twitch. 
Doc had to go as well, as de facto commander, and Nubby was drafted to push the pallet and keep the commissar under supervision. While the trainees were directed to stay put, keep our revac secure, and finish prepping our gear for extraction. The final member of the rescue team was Spot, now disconnected from the security system, and hovering invisibly ahead of the relief force, performing the usual scouting duties as well as acting as a door opening guide skull. In short order the commissar's pallet was loaded with oak spooky boxes, an impressive supply of ammunition, and a sizable crate of grenades, death packs, and mines for our poor, undisciplined demo trooper. The commissar, growing increasingly excited at the prospect of a valiant charge, didn't seem to notice that all these were placed in cover behind him, rather than the reverse, and eagerly bellowed at Nubby to push him faster, so he could hit the vile heretics with his, now empty, drink. With Tink and Spot scouting and door opening, the relief force crossed the facility in a remarkably short time, with no hindrances greater than the occasional panic scribe or stormtrooper dodging out of the way and yelling at us for violating the facility rules on both running and riding pallets. This abruptly changed when we reached the broken junction connecting to Oak's hallway, where Spot spotted a fire team of disguised inquisitorial agents that had set up a fortified position by propping three of the doors open with heavy crates. Their opponents, a few disorganized stormtroopers trying to leapfrog up one of the side halls, seemed to be holding the majority of their attention. Doc called a short halt at the junction door between us and the hostiles kill zone, where a very confused and slightly shot stormtrooper armed with nothing but a dat hislet warned everyone not to open the door if we didn't want to get shot. The medic, after a brief pause to hit the man with a stim and toss him both a field dressing and a less pistol, evaluated the tactical possibilities and proposed popping our own door open enough to hit them with a quick nade barrage, and then moving up in tandem with the stormtroopers in the other hall. This plan completely failed to account for the commissar, who berated him for his cowardice, shouted at the wounded stormtrooper to stop bleeding, get up, and opened the door and ordered Nubby to charge. Amazingly, not only did both troopers follow these dubious orders, so did Tink. In the dead sicker closet, our techie consulted Spot's view from above the enemy's makeshift pillbox, and tried to figure out which icons on the cogitator, all of them now in TAU script, corresponded to which door. After nearly three seconds of this tedious drudgery, he shrugged, and just mashed them all, as every single hall, room, and closet door in the area abruptly locked open. The confusion level rose by several notches, especially for the four, presumably, conspiracy agents holding the junction, who suddenly had a lot less cover to work with. They were so busy scrambling for cover from the no longer suppressed stormtroopers that they didn't even notice Nubby and the commissar until the first few poorly aimed less pistol shots hit the wall's floor ceiling around them. Doc's shots, rather better aimed thanks to his stationary position, not to mention sobriety, and Spot's TAU marker thingy, dropped a deformed young man dressed as a scribe. Combined with the wounded stormtrooper's own covering fire and the fusillade coming from the side hall, the enemy barely managed to get a single volley of poorly aimed shots off before the commissar, Nubby, and the pallet full of high explosives and eldritch boxes reached them. Of course, since neither Nubby or the commissar had put any thought into stopping the pallet, the fight literally didn't stop there. The, now only two, agents watched in stunned surprise as the pallet, with the commissar flailing a bottle in one hand and a pistol in the other, and Nubby hunched up behind him wildly firing his pulse carbine, barreled right through the junction. The whole stopping problem was then solved by the more substantial barricade of boxes, along with a vox unit, the man in the big hat sitting on the floor and yelling into said vox unit, and the medic-y patching said man's numerous frag wounds. There was an audible crunch as the heavy pallet bounced over Inquisitor Big Hat's knees, briefly dragging the screaming man along as the charge crashed to a halt in a scattered pile of inquisitorial evidence boxes. Nubby, screaming just as much, though in blind panic as opposed to pain, turned around as the Inquisitor finally rolled free and hosed the man with point-blank automatic pulse fire. The burst was followed, rather too late, by a crackling buzzing sound in the man's leaking corpse teleporting away. Nubby shrugged, shot the crumpled form of the medic-y a few times instead, and then hopped up to help the commissar fire wildly down the hallway full of panicking conspiracy agents. In Oak's vault, Sergeant Twitch cursed in relief as their collars finally stopped with the shocking and beeping, and staggered up to the barricade just in time to take advantage of the ensuing chaos. 
Amy, with the advantage of prior warning and Tink's drone hastily marking her targets, managed to drop two agents in Stormtrooper armor before the fight even properly started. On cue, the two least scrawny scribes yanked away one of the shelves forming the right side of the barricade, and Sergeant Twitch squeezed through the gap. Under the dubious cover of the Commissar and Nubby's random firing, Sergeant Twitch sprinted, well, more lurched, past two distracted Storm agents who didn't have time to turn and follow before Amy's second volley dropped them as well. Reaching the open door of the lower security vault across the hall, Sludge and Twitch swept the room, finding nothing more dangerous than two more terrified and confused scribes, and took up firing positions as the initial confused chaos began to resolve into a proper fight fight. Or it would've, if both sides had brought a crate of grenades. At Twitch's urgent insistence, Nubby abandoned the barricade to the somehow still unshot commissar, and cracked open a good old fashioned big box of boom. Well, more of a big box of assorted thrown munitions, because the first two to pop over the barricade were flashes, followed by another pair of smokes and the commissar's empty bottle. The bottle's owner, who hadn't caught the flashes out, swore and continued firing undeterred. Under this cover, Sludge and Twitch put the last of their shots into the stunned idiot pretend stormtroopers who'd neglected to actually wear their damn helmets photo visors. For all the damage they did though, it was Amy that really convinced the rest of the hallway's occupants to get into cover and stay there. One eye closed and the other held directly to the Zenitech scope on her beloved rifle. She leaned out into the hall and started picking off enemies through the billowing smoke as spot the wonder drone marked them. Of course the enemy, being you know, inquisitorial agents too, and presumably better trained ones at that, did not take this lying down. Our little dynamic entry had blown open their rear flank, and scattered the unprepared reserves and specialists, but they rapidly began laying down their own covering fire and coordinating a tactical advance. Worse, from the far end of the hall, where there seemed to be some sort of ongoing fi fight with some security stormtroopers, a gangly form that glowed far too brightly on spots thermal imaging turned from the fight. Amy swore as the figure pointed an arm directly towards her and fired an emperor damn melter beam out of his hand. For once, Amy actually bloody ducked, barely dodging under the beam as it blasted a glowing hole through several crates and a fair bit of wall, as well as setting the barricade on fire. Sarge looked on with an expression of appropriately sergeantly approval, which transformed into an evil grin as Nubby hucked a bandolier of frags into Twitch's waiting hands. Acting before someone could tell him not to, Twitch pulled a single pin off the bandolier, sent the whole thing whirling down the smoke-filled hall, and told Nubby to toss him another. There were no further pyromantic melter beams. Covering grenade barrages being more effective than covering fire, Sarge decided he could be spared to do some sergeanting and began coordinating the actual secret mission part of the secret mission. The growing collection of terrified, psychically traumatized scribes cowering inside the assorted vaults was barked into order under the pretense of an evacuation. This evac was unexpectedly aided by the commissar, still firing wildly down the hallway, slurrily announcing that he'd come to save them and urging them to hurry while he had the heretics pinned. The remarkably orderly file of age pencil pushers filed along the edges of the hall, and were passed into the care of a puffing, limping dock in the wounded stormtrooper he'd seemingly adopted. In an act of actual tactical brilliance, the medic used this influx of civvies as an excuse to redirect the rest of the reinforcing stormtroopers coming up the side hall back around to help their compatriots fighting to take the far junction. The sight of Twitch giddily dispensing grenades down smoking. Burning hallway strongly reinforced the tactical sense of not going this way, and the stormtroopers departed without argument. With the civvies, not to mention witnesses, out of the way, and Nubby finished dispensing munitions, Sludge dropped back to help the little trooper haul Oak's boxes off the pallet and crouch run them down to the main vault. The barricade being slightly collapsed and on fire, the non-com declined to try and worm his way through personally, and jammed Nubby and the boxes through one of the gaps before voxing Tink to ask if he knew why the damn fire suppression system wasn't working. He then swore as a sudden geyser of white powder began shooting out of every air vent in the hallway, along with even more alarms. More surprising, and considerably more distracting, was the sudden appearance of several conspiracy agents sprinting up the hall. Whether seizing the reduced vision as a chance to charge our position, or just withdraw from the besieged junction, the sudden rush was more than Twitch's indiscriminate barrage could handle alone. 
and both Sarge and Amy hastily return to firing down the hall. In between scanning the hallway for the next marker lip form, coughing, and cursing his helmet's lack of a rebreather, Sarge bellowed at Nubby to swap Oak's boxes with the empty ones on the table and get back out here. He was less than happy to have a nasal little voice ask what to do with all the stuff in our boxes, because a lot of it was just traffic tickets, but some of it looked pretty valuable, specifically all these really fancy techy fingies. Sarge, sparing an exasperated second to explain to Nubby that he'd been supposed to unload the boxes before bringing them, and no Asuka made me do it is still not a valid excuse for skiving out of one's duties, and to just dump them all in the other boxes, since we were bringing them back out with us. Nubby asked if that included the parking tickets, and was told to shut up and soldier, soldier, before Sarge came in there and gave him a demonstration. Properly motivated, it didn't take long for Nubby to do the swap, before the attacking conspiracy agents could accomplish anything more than getting their 2.1 shot, Nubby and the incriminating crate squeeze back out into the hallway, and the withdrawal started, Twitch, who'd scrambled back to the pallet when he'd run out of grenades again, started dispensing the leftover frags and smokes, combined with Amy's overwatch, this was decent enough cover for Sarge and Nubby's sprint back to the pallet with the cargo. Swearing at each other as the occasional blind fired last bolt scorched overhead, and swearing at the commissar when one of his even less aimed shots actually hit Sarge in the shoulder. To no effect, the pair hefted the boxes back onto the pallet, and then covered Amy's retreat. The conspiracy agents made their move with perfect timing, starting their attack at the exact same moment Amy started her sprint. A tight cluster of the ones and stormtrooper uniforms made a mad sprint through the edge of the smoke taking up Amy's old position as if they'd actually planned and practiced the whole maneuver. Even more shocking than their sudden appearance was the enemy's ability to not only use cover intelligently, but to actually do it better than us. Sarge traded two shots for zero hits, a terrifying graze along his helmet, and shot that somehow, despite his cover and all sane logic, managed to him square in the left leg. Twitch at least managed to drop one, before a downright ridiculously well-timed last bolt nailed him in the chest plot mid-second shot, not quite penetrating fortunately. Nubby, not being a chump, decided to keep his hair down and perform the very important task of turning the commissar's pallet around in preparation for imminent cheesing it. The commissar, seemingly unaware of the danger, or the fact that he'd been shot twice, bellowed incomprehensibly as he turned in his seat to keep firing. Amazingly, despite this sudden onslaught, Amy managed her sprint without taking a hit. Whether luck or fate, she managed to duck or dodge every shot fired her way, ending in a final little hop onto turning pallet and taking up a firing position leaning around the commissar's rotating chair. This heroic maneuver was subsequently spoiled by a spookily well-aimed last bolt which would have nailed the markswoman in the face if it hadn't had the bulk of the commissar's leg to burn through on its way. Despite having an entire limb charred to uselessness, the commissar didn't seem to notice this injury any more than his others, at least not until his efforts to keep turning and firing led him to actually put his weight on the appendage. The commissar's collapse more or less directly onto Amy was followed by his augmentically connected chair, which at least offered the pair some cover. Sergeant Twitch, who also had cover, not that it seemed to be doing anything, hurriedly crawled backwards out of the contested hallway as eerily curving last bolts landed around them. Sarge made a little pained grunting sound as one of them found their mark in the general vicinity of his already shot leg, and flopped prone halfway through the door. Fortunately Nubby, standing by exactly for such an occasion, as opposed to just, you know, standing by, was able to grab the big noncom's arm, and drag him the rest of the way into the junction and around the corner. Overhead, a translucent blow shot by, and the hallway's heavy security door slammed shut. The panting silence that followed was punctuated by the sound of a few dozen last bolts plinking ineffectively off the closed door, as well as the commissar and Amy's curses, and Sarge informing everyone present that he'd been shot in the ass. Twice. Doc, standing in one of the side halls with the better part of a dozen real stormtroopers, and what looked to be even more scribes than he'd started with, took this as an invitation. Doc's tridge started with Sarge, but his heroic butt wounds were passed over in favor of the commissar's half-shot-off leg. While the medic did his work, 
the question of why the scribes were still around was raised, and Doc explained that they'd been unwilling to go anywhere without a trusted escort. Despite the shotness of his ass, our heroic commander could still recognize a tactical moment when he stepped in one, and loudly announced that we'd leave this position to the stormtroopers while we pulled back with the non-combatants to the, uh, aid station. The one that definitely existed. Whether it was respect for someone who just stormed the position they'd been assaulting, and with half their numbers, or thankfulness for how much easier the big closed door made their job, or just Sarge's sargeness, the stormtroopers let us and the scribes leave without any awkward questions. Sarge was loaded onto the pallet, along with a crate for Doc to sit on while he worked on patching the commissar's wounds, and Nubby started pushing them along while Amy and Twitch took point and rearguard. The commissar, having been hauled back upright along with his chair by some helpful stormtroopers, perked up as Doc hit him with a stim and, at the medic's urging, bellowed the gaggle of scribes into semi-orderly ranks behind us as we made our leisurely retreat. In the time it took the overloaded pallet and small army of scribes to traverse the facility, both Sludge and the Commissar were patched up to the point of functionality, and a few ideas about how to ditch our baggage and extract were floated. To nobody's surprise it was Doc's plan that Sarge ended up adopting. Specifically the part where he suggested offloading both the scribes and the commissar together, leaving us free to get the hell out of there before the Inquisition got its shit together. Amy was sent ahead, and greeted us at what was now the dead sicker hallway in her cadet commissar uniform, though still holding her pulse rifle. In a feat of genuinely good acting, the markswoman congratulated the commissar on his successful mission to rescue the bureaucratic lifeblood of the Imperium and reported that she and her penal legionnaires had secured the room full of unconscious naked guys as he'd instructed. The commissar, who'd been brought nearly to the point of sobriety between the adrenaline and Doc's stims, gave Amy a slightly dubious look as she lauded his tactical genius and selfless bravery, but was smart enough to just shut up and roll with it. Between Amy and the ex-scribe trainee, the elderly commissar was prompted through a very, very, creative interpretation of the day's events. It started believably enough with him volunteering to help collect her things, and then quickly veering into complete fiction at the part where his boon companion Commissar Sawface tipped us off to some sort of foul doings in the evidence building. By the end of it, both elderly Commissars had been painted as the biggest damn commissarial heroes since Bloody Kane, and despite literally all evidence to the contrary, the still growing mob of frightened pencil pushers ate it up like nubby at a buffet. The one sticky moment in all this was when Commissar Kelly, hero of the Imperium, raised the question of what had happened to Commissar Sawface. After a brief pause for thought, Amy straight facetly explained to both the man and the audience that Sawface had died. Heroically, the Commissar's expression didn't change much, but he grinned a little as he leaned in and asked just how heroically she meant. Amy grinned a little too, and quietly informed him that we'd had to use a bucket to hold all the little pieces. The pair shared a moment of profound mutual satisfaction at this word picture, and then the old commissar sat back up, winked at her, and began loudly eulogizing his longest serving comrade to the assembled audience. Behind all this, several overloaded pallets were quietly lined up in the hallway, and five stormtroopers and five legionnaires became ten legionnaires, all ready to depart with Lady Von Humperding's personal effects, if she was done here. We had a ship to catch after all. Catching the hint nicely, Commissar Kelly waved Amy and the rest of us off, promising to stay here and keep the scribes safe until the all clear came. As we nonchalantly rounded the corner, and then immediately kicked it up to a full sprint, we could hear the familiar voice of the good scribe, operating on a suggestion from one of the trainees, asking if it was true the two commissars had stationed here under orders of the Ordas Kronos. The helpful old scribe seemed very concerned about how long it had been since anyone had reviewed the whole pending order, and suggested there might be something that could be done to resolve the issue. He seemed rather shocked when the commissar burst into tears. Our vague plan for changing back into our legionnaire uniforms and exiting inconspicuously via the freight bay hit a snag when the two squads of now fully armed and armored stormtroopers stationed there immediately spotted us. Two of the stormtroopers made a beeline for us, causing a brief moment of panic, until we recognized the freshly cleaned chain sword and bandaged fingers on the storm Rupert, backed up by the bulky form of what was presumably the same sergeant from the front desk. While Amy fielded the Storm Rupert and his proudly proffer chainsword with the rigid politeness of someone who desperately wanted to just shoot the man, 
the security sergeant scanned our whole group and then bore down on Sarge. In a harsh voice, the non-com had asked we had any idea what in the emperor's name was going on, because some incompetent screw head of an excuse for a tech priest had not only managed to accidentally crash the comb network, they'd actually done it twice, and it was all he could do to keep the storm Rupert from going off to reconnoiter. Tim took offense at this description, beginning to explain that while the first time had been an accident, taking it back down the second time had been totally intentional. Sarge cut this all off before it could start, and gave his brother non-officer a level look, before bluntly announcing that word was that Inquisitor Big Hat had rolled in with an infiltration force complete with Sika support, got caught, and got shot. The security sergeant swore in the familiar tone of someone who'd told them this was going to happen, and marched off to extract the Storm Rupert from an exceedingly unwise attempt to buckle Amy's holster on for her. We completed our exit without further violence, if only barely, and beat a restrained retreat back towards the camp. As we approached, it became obvious that embarkation was in full swing, and there wasn't much time before people started being marked a wall. In fact, it was already past that point, according to the panicked looking cadet Commissar Sniffy, who ran up from where he'd been leaning outside the front gate, conveniently out of sight of any superior officers, and demanded to know where in the Emperor's name we'd been and Commissar Kelly still was. Cadet Sniffy's questions had been directed at the ex-scribe trainee, presumably because of their working relationship managing the Commissar's paperwork, but seemed just as willing to accept an answer from fellow Cadet Amy. Both of them just looked at Sarge though, and the noncom grudgingly hauled himself up from his comfortable spot lying face down on one of the boxes. Once again going for brevity, Sarge announced that we'd gone to get Amy's shit. Commissars Kelly and Sawface had gotten themselves involved in an internal inquisition pissing match. Again, and we left them to it in favor of catching our ride off this bloody rock. Cadet Sniffy's face was a study in anxiety as he processed this and desperately tried to figure out where the fesses were going to fall, and how best to avoid getting any of it on him. Sarge, seeing a young sorta officer in desperate need of some handling, limped over and put a paternal, not to mention sweaty, blood spattered, and very heavy, arm around Cadet Sniffy's shoulders. He quietly reassured the young man that he didn't need to worry, because old Kelly had been looking out for him. Or to be more precise, he'd been looking out for Amy, and had asked his inexplicably reconciled old enemy Sawface to field promote her, as well as transferring her to the outgoing Legion. At this point, Sarge gave Tink a meaningful look, which the techie missed entirely as he sat on his makeshift throne of spooky boxes, blatantly screwing around with a slightly bloody commissarial data slot. Twitch had to poke him. Cadet Sniffy wasn't quite dim enough to miss Tink's self-narrated exploration of the Slate's personnel management tool, but this meant he was bright enough not to raise a fuss and get his neck broken. Nubby helpfully informed the bug-eyed cadet this was one of them posthumous promotion thingies. Totally legit. Sniffy hesitantly checked his data slit's little digital org chart of permanent base personnel, marveling at Amy's new status as his, provisional, superior, until she abruptly disappeared off it entirely. Sarge grinned down at the trembling young cadet commissar, and asked whether he'd like a promotion and transfer to. Provisional commissar Sniffy nodded. Aided and abetted by the increasingly optimistic Sniffy, we managed to walk our entire convoy straight onto one the massive troop lifters nestled into the mud of the mustering field. There was a brief hiccup as a cogboy leapt into our path, nearly going down under the wheels of Twitch's pallet, but he only seemed to be interested in ray sanctifying our collar's machine spirits, that and all the mud. Once a servitor had hosed us off, it was just a matter of requisitioning a cargo unit for Commissar Von Humperding's personal effects, and then settling into our assigned seats like good little penal legionnaires. It was a nerve-wrenching hour before our lifter sealed its hatches, but no inquisitors, stormtroopers, or senior commissars came looking for us. In fact, the chaos of what seemed to be a very rushed deployment was enough to keep anyone aside from the odd grimly curious legionnaire from asking any questions, and it wasn't hard for Amy to quash those. The transfer to the high security Munitorum troop ship, already packed near full with three other legions and their attendant commissarial blocking units, was a bit trickier, involving dodging senior commissars, Munitorum beam counters, and an overly inquisitive cyber mastiff. Fortunately, a combination of lies, bribery, 
and Tink's continued infiltration of the commissarial data net got all of us aboard, including the nervous Sniffy, who practically sobbed with relief when Sergeant Amy finally said he could go. As the painfully junior commissar jogged off to catch his transfer shuttle, Amy confided that she and Tink had found him a ground logistics unit whose commissarial berth had been left empty for the better part of two centuries. She hoped he liked long drives. Rather than put any poor overworked munitorum and commissariat busybodies through the effort of finding somewhere to put us, we secured our own berth in a small cargo bay which had been mysteriously assigned to both organizations, depending on which datanet you checked. The door was then locked, barred, and rigged with directional mines by a hysterically relieved twitch. Perimeter secure at bloody last, Sludge finally gave the order to stand down, and then limped to the front of the line for Tink to remove his damn collar. Fourth in this line, per guard issue a pecking order, was Nubby, who brought up the question of where to shove this techy feng that one fit back in its box. The oblong conglomeration of slightly battered electronics that Nubby pulled from his pocket looked like almost nothing Tink had ever seen. Admittedly, that almost was doing a lot of work standing and for the time we'd rediscovered a Necron ship retrofitted with a techno-heretical combination of TAU and Imperial Tech. The question of why Nubby had a bunch of architecture in his pocket was immediately raised by literally everyone present. Though per tradition, Sludge was allowed to lead the interrogation. Nubby's expression rapidly shifted from proudly proactive procurer to guy who didn't do nothing and nobody saw I'm anyways, as he explained that someone had installed fake bottoms in our spooky boxes like we wouldn't notice. Even worse, they'd done it with our stuff, or at least he was pretty sure that both the cardboard and the faux velvet lining came from his stash in that one closet just down the hall from the sicker containment cells back on the occurrence border. He'd been debating ripping it all out, it being his personal property and Sarge insisting that everything was supposed to come out of our spooky boxes, but then they wouldn't have matched the inside of the boxes they were replacing. Which was all why he'd stuck to simply grabbing the techy feng that had been hidden inside the last box's fake bottom. The said techy feng was, well, a techy thing. What it did or how he was supposed to be controlled was unclear, but parts of it were definitely recognizable as ours. Tink identified several TAU-ish components as parts of Spot 2.0, along with a few others from one of the frequently repaired sea suppressors, and what he swore was a piece of our wraith bone. Just as recognizable, if much, much less ours, was the fist-sized Necron cube wedged in the middle of the thing. The little yellow sticky note saying this end towards the demon was new though, there was not a reaming. Sludge was too tired. Instead, the question of how to unfuck up this most monumental of fuck ups was raised and vigorously debated. The whole concept of going back down to the evidence building and putting the damn thing back was rejected, though the idea of sending Nubby to do it himself had a certain grim appeal to it. A distant second best would be getting the device itself back to Inquisitor Oak, or at the very least a message to the effect of someone accidentally disarmed your super secret architecture anti-demon mine. But that was hampered by the man's status as the Inquisition's most wanted. Not only did we not know where the man was or how to reach him, we weren't even sure there was anyone else who actually did. The interrogator he'd sent to help us was long gone, and the only other one of his agents known to us was the little old lady adept who'd helped railroad us into the penal legion. Even if we could get either the device or a message through Inquisition security to the adept, there wasn't a guarantee she'd be in a position to actually do anything. The trainees, not that term remotely applied anymore, were making a solid argument for just waiting for our promised extraction from the penal legion, especially on the grounds of how it'd serve the slippery old bastard right if he turned out to have been lying about getting us out, when Amy brought up one last option. Our markswoman very reluctantly announced that she knew someone who would know how to reach Oak if anyone did, and she was in orbit right now. Specifically, she was aboard the Exorcist class Grand Cruiser, Furious Avenger, along with a whole regiment of Palladium Super Heavy Armor and with the better part of half a battle group in tow. When several seconds went by without anyone asking the obvious question, Amy finally admitted she was talking about her mother, at least the presence of Lady General Von Humperding, along with several regiments of loyal guardsmen and not insignificant amount of naval firepower explained why everyone had been practically bending over backwards for Amy. 
She assured us she hadn't actually known herself though, not until she and Tink had looked through the local system org chart for somewhere to send Sniffy. The trainees, not having benefited from any of Amy's highly educational drunken 3am rants about her mother, needed to be brought up to speed on Amy's mom's rank and how Oak had used her to get us assigned to the penal legion. The rambling stories about Lady General Mom literally crushing the bones of her political rivals under the treads of her banner blade, Becky, and even letting an 8-year-old Amy drive on one occasion, were left out. Amy firmly asserted that her mother was totally fucking in on all this inquisitorial bullshit or she wouldn't be here and would be able to get a message to Oak at the very least. The question of whether she could do the same with the device itself was answered for us as the thrum of the troop ship's activating engines informed us that the embarkation had gone a lot faster than we'd expected. This was, for quite a few reasons, not a good thing. Tink, in a moment very reminiscent of our inglorious retreat from a certain TAU-ish PDF base, whipped out saw faces dat hislet and started taking dictation from Amy and Sarge. While Doc kept Twitch and Nubby from helping and the trainees viewed the whole situation with bemused alarm, a very, very straightforward citrup was written, encrypted, tagged with some code words Amy supplied, and sent off via the commissariat's data network as the highest security communique the data slit could send. Then, realizing we actually had a few hours before we left the range of the orbital comb network, Amy grabbed a data slit and wrote a rather more in-depth and better spelled version. We hadn't gotten a response by the time we transited into the warp, which was almost a relief given how beat up and exhausted we all were. Doc set about actually treating everyone's wounds, including a visit to the ship's med bay to get Tink's legs set properly. This cunning infiltration was accomplished by trading out our collars and penal legion uniforms for our old guard kit and identifying ourselves as guardsmen. Janirian 99th, detached. The same trick got us into the mess, laundry, and even the astropathic sanctum, though that last one turned out to be a bust. It wasn't that they caught us or something, it was just that the astropaths were all in psychic isolation to protect them from the warp shadow of the encroaching tyrannid splinter fleet we were being sent off to delay. The news of our destination wasn't really that big a deal in and of itself. After all, when you're in a penal legion every mission is a suicide mission. We were just glad it wasn't orcs. It did recontextualize the whole situation though, from the incredibly rushed embarkation to the presence of Lady General Von Hamperding and her battle group. The one question it really left was whether Oak was actually a cunning enough bastard for an Emperor damn tyrannid incursion to be part of his plans, or if we were about to be hung out to dry by sheer bad luck. This conundrum was the primary topic of discussion for the majority of the trip, and kept us nicely distracted, and Twitch and Nubby out of trouble, until we reached our destination just over a week later. The debarkation of the four penal legions was less rushed, the Nid's arrival time having been more firmly pinned down by some sort of techno sickery. Our first inclination, to stay in our hidey hole until the ship was mostly empty, and nobody who might recognize us and ask questions was around, was foiled as a munitorium clerk came down our hallway, opening bays for inventory and inspection. Twitch barely got his mind disarmed in time. We reluctantly put our penal legion uniforms back on as well as our collars, deactivated, of course, and formed up with all our gear in a convoy around a very commissarial looking Amy. There were a few sketchy moments, especially when some familiar goonish looking legionnaires tried to route our little baggage train through the quartermaster's tents for inventory. They desisted after Amy shot one in the knee, but that led to some very curious looks from the assorted commissars present, and a tactical withdrawal behind one of the landing craft was all that kept us from an encounter with the commandant cum commander. Somehow we made it to evening muster without things devolving into bloodshed, and tediously stoiced our way through an only slightly grimmer than usual pre-action speech from the brass. Things didn't get interesting until the commissar commander waved forward the inquisitor, and announced the need for volunteers for a vortex bomb deep strike on the lead tyrannid elements. The inquisitor, nestled in a suit of guard issue power armor, hadn't stood out from the other battlefield brass milling around the command tent. Neither had his two sickers, at least not until one of them started bouncing up and down waving at us, until his senior firmly hushed him back into order. Following the young sicker's gaze, the inquisitor stomped over and loudly requested a right sergeantly chap with a band of stout lads primed for a bit of daring do and a conspicuous valor in the face of the unholy. What what as if that wasn't enough, 
The Rupert strode over, Alfred and Fumbles in tow, and greeted his distant cousin, Lady Amelia Dolores sister Amnita Trigestrata Zildana Malafi von Humperding, and asked if she'd ever seen a vortex bomb. Commissar Amy blinked with a sense of vague recognition, and announced that she and her honor guard stood ready, willing, and eager to see what an exeterminatus grade munition could do to the enemies of the Emperor. As a whole unit, we grabbed our shit and double timed it for the familiar looking stealth shuttle sitting at the edge of the field. The commissar commander practically sprinted over, presumably to inform the Rupert of Amy's non-expendable status, but suddenly got distracted as Fumbles and Alfred both glared in his direction. The commander was still busy chewing out a random cadet for some minor, possibly imaginary, uniform infraction when we scrambled aboard the gifted Emperor's Scythe stealth shuttle and immediately lifted off. At that point, the fact that the shuttle's pilot turned out to be Jim barely even qualified as a surprise. Introductions were made, along with the traditional fancy seeing you hear quips, and a rather protracted roll call of the Rupert and Amy's mutual families. Surprisingly, we didn't have to introduce the trainees, as the Rupert greeted them each by name, which was better than we could do, and declared himself to be downright chuffed to have some proper guardsmen serving in his retinue. The ex-scribes correction that none of them had actually ever been in the guard, unless you counted a few months in an undeployed penal legion, was blithely dismissed with a quip about it being more of a state of mind. This didn't exactly encourage them. But with a bit of reassurance from both us and Alfred, the trainees accepted their sudden career change with only a reasonable amount of dubiousness. As for us, we were not cordially drafted into the Rupert's inquisitorial retinue, as Oak still had shit for us to do. What specifically was a bit unclear though, since neither Jim and Fumbles, or the Rupert and Alfred had talked to the Inquisitor since he'd left to turn himself in. Needless to say, that remark caught our undivided attention, but the four of them insisted that it was all part of some presumably brilliant plan, which involved him showing up for his trial while the better part of three quarters of the Inquisitorial fleet was distracted. Nubby and Twitch smirked as they collected their winnings from those of us who hadn't believed Oak was both capable and crazy enough to try and exploit a tyrannid incursion for political benefit. Of course, bringing up the subject of the imminent nids raised the question of what in the Emperor's name we were doing here. More specifically, we wanted to know why Jim was still flying us right into the Splinter Fleet's predicted emergence zone, and what that vortex bomb actually was, because we'd seen one before, and they typically don't have either TAU or Wraithbone components. The Rupert waved these questions away as not something to tickle your wigs over, and Jim's attention seemed fully focused on the shuttle's clutch together nav system, but Fumbles cheerfully explained that the bomb was just a fancy sea suppressor Fio put together to keep him and Alfred from exploding. The obvious question that remark raised went unasked as the Vox unit blared an all ships warning of imminent tyrannid emergence in Sector 17. Jim shouted at everyone to get in their seats and activated the weird sea suppressor. Now we had a bit of experience with sea suppressors, or at least Tink did, but we'd never encountered one that felt like this. It was like having one of those super untouchables pressing right up against you, and both Fumbles and Alfred abruptly curled in on themselves and started shaking. For all its power though, the device still wasn't enough to keep us from feeling the horrible chittering, clawing psychic force that erupted from the jagged hole in reality forming in front of us. Amazingly, the horrible psychic pressure actually managed to grow stronger, seemingly pressing in on the psychic shielding from all sides and compressing it into a smaller and smaller area. Then, very abruptly, and with a distinct popping sensation, the pressure vanished, leaving a stubby little junk heap of a warp ship floating where the glowing hole in reality had been. Jim hailed the occurrence border and brought us in for a landing. Behind our shuttle, several very confused inquisitorial warships double-checked their all specs readings as another small warp transition occurred, leaving the very pressing question of where the Tyranids were, and what in the Emperor's name had just happened to all their astropaths, navigators, and sanctioned combat seekers. Aboard the occurrence border, in what was apparently no longer the Warp Fungus Bay, a delegation consisting of a very relieved sister Valerie and Hannah, backed up by their usual collection of medical and technical minions, welcomed us back. They were followed up by a considerably less welcoming delegation, consisting of an oversized servo skull with the brain of an undeniably insane Margos biologist wedged inside of it. 
the Margos, initially intent on getting an account of the recent cyclic phenomena from the badly shaken fumbles and Alfred abruptly stopped in midair, well to face the nubby proof case full of Archiatech handcuffed to Sarge's arm. The ear numbing, distorted screech of what did you idiots do was, well, exactly what we expected. Sarge sighed and relinquished the case, gathered up the Rupert and Alfred, and, after establishing the definite unavailability of Doc, grabbed Amy for moral support as he headed up to the bridge for what was going to be a very, very long debriefing. Well, that was worth the wait. Thank you guys for coming back, I know it's been a very, very long time. Also, definitely check out Shoggy's website, and also check out his Twitter. He does an awful lot more than just the old garden party, so definitely something to check out. If you enjoy this story half as much as what I enjoy it, you'll definitely want to see what other stuff that he gets up to, because honestly, I, I just wish the guy loot more so it is, frankly, but, you know, look, it's worth the wait. Like anything, it comes eventually, and I'm sure the next part will be the end. And I'm almost kind of sad that it's coming to an end, because this, this story has been something that we've been doing here for so long and it's genuinely such an integral part of like TG culture. I feel like there's just something sp like it really does hold a special place in my heart, you know? Um, I don't really want to keep you guys for much longer because of course it's a very long video, but I just like to say thank you all for coming back. I know when did we start doing this? Um, the actual story started in like what 2014, you know, coming up on what eight years. And uh, I started doing the story in like 2017, maybe 2018, you know? So uh, again, that's like four or five years ago, which is kind of insane when you think about it. But it is an amazing story. It's one of the best. It's actually, it's so much better than the bulk of actual 40k stories, like the official ones. I suppose we don't need to talk about them, do we? But anyway, like, I really, I thank you guys for staying and coming back and all that stuff. It really does mean a lot to us, and definitely you need to go ahead. And even if, like, I don't use Twitter at all, but I use it just for Shoggy because, look, it's the best way to keep up to speed and to know what's going on. You know what I mean? So, uh, look, thank you guys for tuning in, and I'll see you later.